nine o'clock. So to let you all know, um, for those of you who don't know, I'm Ruth Seguenza and I'm the tab facilitator. Um, we do record tab meetings. Um, we also have a transcript that we run that helps with meeting notes. So uh, to let you know, the meeting is being recorded. As you join us, um, we use chat for a lot of things to help our online meetings run a little better. Um, the first thing I will ask you to do, if you haven't already done it, is type your name and your affiliation into the chat. Um, we've got some record keeping requirements under the Federal Advisory Committee Act. And um, if you do that, one, we, we know you're here. It's kind of like a sign-in sheet. And we spell your name right and your organization's name right, which um, saves us embarrassment down the line. Start out with our DDFO. And I'm going to invite Stan Branch to open the meeting. Stan? Good morning. Can you hear me? Yeah. So, good morning. And welcome to the March 22 Hampton Advisory Board meeting. My name is Stan Branch. I am the Deputy Designated Federal Officer for the Hanford site. As a reminder, this meeting will be conducted in accordance with the requirements of the Federal Advisory Committee Act. Advisory committees have played an important role in shaping programs and policies of the federal government. The Hanford Advisory Board's role is to provide policy level advice and recommendations concerning the following EM specific site, EM site specific issues, such as cleanup activities and environmental restoration, waste and nuclear materials management and disposition, excess facilities, future land use and long-term stewardship, risk management and communications. I appreciate your attendance today and look forward to the Hampton Advisory Board's development and submission of constructive, actionable policy level advice on the Hampton cleanup. Again, welcome and look forward to the construction meeting. Thank you. Back to you, Ruth. Thank you. My computer is more live than I thought today. Um, Steve, do you want to say a few words before we jump into the agenda and action items? Yes, uh, thank you. First, I just wanted to point out for everybody that is either part of the board or listening in that uh, what we are. Uh, the Hanford Advisory Board provides one of many public voices to the Hanford Cleanup Mission. The HAB has issued more than 300 advisories and recommendations in its 27 plus years. Its members are primarily volunteers, some of whom are reimbursed, who dedicate themselves to learning all they can about Hanford cleanup, engage in civil discussion, and reach consensus on advice that we hope will advance the Hanford cleanup. Its primary mission is to provide informed recommendations to the U.S. Department of Energy, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, and the Washington State Department of Ecology. These are the parties to the tri-party agreement, the legal agreement that governs the work. The board aims to develop informed consensus, policy level recommendations and advice that represent the very diverse opinions and perspectives of communities, citizens, and organizations throughout the region. The board helps the broader public become more informed by holding our meetings in an open forum. And this is this is a public meeting. Members are expected to communicate with their constituents as well as to help them remain informed and meaningfully involved in Hanford cleanup decisions. The board works, and this is important, the board works through a committee process to become educated on cleanup issues. Committee members develop informed draft advice to bring to a for, full board meeting for discussion and, and consensus. Um, that's important today because we have three pieces of advice that have gone through issue manager teams and committees <clears throat> and are now being presented to the full board. So it's the opportunity for the full board to become informed enough to make a determination on consensus. My role in that process is to try to help keep us civil, make sure that everybody who has an opinion has an opportunity to say it, and it doesn't necessarily have to agree with the proponents of the advice. 
um, the completion of cleanup is decades long and the demographics continue to evolve. And in that regard, DOE is seeking to expand the diversity of this organization. Um, they have member responsibilities is to be informed, of course, but during the meeting, please listen carefully. Be open, patient, and attentive. And I know there's a lot of passion behind some of the material that will be discussed today. So I just ask that you <clears throat> be respectful of each other and um, recognize that um, inappropriate language doesn't contribute to understanding. So with that, uh, I apologize. My voice is cracking a little bit because the early spring allergies are starting to kick in. <clears throat> Hopefully that made sense. So we do have a quorum. So for today's agenda, we're going to start off today hearing from the TPA agencies um, and, and their updates with uh, what's new, what progress has been made, um, what issues they're facing. We will then move into the draft advice from the Executive Issues Committee, the EIC, on HAB membership changes. Take lunch. This afternoon, we'll look at two pieces of advice, um, one from the Budgets and Contracts Committee on cleanup priorities, and another on leaking tanks from the Tank Waste Committee. That's really day one. The question you're going to face at the end of the discussion for each of these three pieces of draft advice is, is the advice in concept saying what you want it to say so we can take it to day two of the meeting for consensus and adoption? Um, so we're looking at the big picture comments and big agreement on the advice points. Um, we can wordsmith after the meeting today. That often happens in a, a small group if there's some wordsmithing that needs to happen. We can also wordsmith some tomorrow. Um, that is the more challenging part of advice. Wordsmithing is, is just hard work. Um, tomorrow, we'll start with looking at each of the three pieces of advice, assuming they pass today, um, for formal adoption. We also have a risk management presentation tomorrow afternoon coming from DOE, um, and that's that's been on the wish list for quite a while. Board business is short this time. Um, it's only got about a half an hour, um, so we're not going to do regular committee reports. I know that that's something that people really um, value out of board meetings, and with three pieces of advice, the time budget didn't allow for that. So um, I know that's not, not what you wanted. Um, we will fit in uh, committee requests um, and those things in, during board business and, and try to make that work as best for you. What questions do you have about the agenda? Anyone? So as we go along, we've got um, got about four people who have called in on the phone. It's hard to see them raise their hands on the phone. So I'll check in periodically if you're on the phone to make sure if you want to speak, we don't forget you. For those of you who are fully into Teams, if you have a question or a comment, let us know in chat. That's actually the best way to get my attention. Um, just, you know, say, you know, I want to be in the queue. We call it queue and you'll see a queue and a list of names as we go along um, to let us know that that you want to speak and, and we want to remember you. Um, there tends to be a lot going on. I try, I, I try to get them in the right order and sometimes I fail. Um, but my intent is to make sure everybody gets a chance to speak, um, whether you are new or whether you've been around a while. Steve. Yeah, just to remind you, my computer does not let me look at chat. I haven't figured out how to make it do that. 
Oh, so, okay. So I'll raise my hand, but I won't be able to read what people are saying in chat. Okay. So yeah, so my my habit, just so you all know, is if somebody types a comment in chat, because we have people on the phone and because sometimes folks can't see the chat, um, I will either put you in queue or ask you if, if you want me to read it out loud so that people can both see and hear whatever it is you're adding to the conversation. So if you go, but I typed it in chat and you put me in the queue, that's why. Um, so with that, ready to move to meeting minutes. So we have two sets of, of meeting minutes to look at, one from the December meeting and one from the January meeting. The December meeting was two days on December 15th and 16th. Um, and I'm going to put Josh on the spot. Josh is our technical writer um, and, and really the backbone of, of the admin behind the, the tab. Josh, do we have comments on the December meeting minutes? Did we get any? didn't warn him that I was going to ask. I, I didn't receive any comments on the December meeting. <clears throat> Are there comments that we need to incorporate? I know it's really small print. Either you all haven't had enough coffee this morning, or there aren't any comments on the meeting minutes. Steve, I suggest if there are no comments that we go ahead and finalize these. I agree. Second set of minutes. Slow this morning. Okay, <laughs> it's okay, Josh. Um, Josh is also our technical support, so sometimes they are doing more than one thing. Um, January, we had a one-day meeting um, focused on uh, membership issues around the HAB. Um, these are the meeting minutes from them. Both of these were in the email that went out with all the documents for this meeting. Um, are there questions or revisions or suggestions about the January 19th meeting minutes? I don't believe that we received any, but if there are some, please let us know. All right, and after, right after we do this, we will do announcements before we move on to the agency update. Steve, I suggest that we finalize these given that I'm not hearing any, <clears throat> any additions or revisions. Agreed. All right. And we, we, we have a quorum, a quorum of silence. Um, that's awesome. <laughs> um, let's move on quickly to announcements so we can. Um, um, Alberto, I know you have an announcement. Yes, thanks, Ruth, uh, for allowing me to announce this. Uh, due to the full schedule of the HAB meeting, as Ruth just explained today and tomorrow, we weren't able to uh, uh, incorporate a, uh, a roundtable discussion on the recent issued Hanford Life Cycle Scope Schedule Cost Report, the DOE uh, um, released in January. Uh, our goal is to have a formal response from the HAB to that document by the end of the comment period, which is April 15th. And so in lieu of the fact that we won't have uh, time for a roundtable discussion with the full HAB today, we've taken an alternate approach, and that is uh, I'm asking you each member to do three things uh, to support that effort. One is to read the attached file that Ruth sent out for this meeting on committee reports. And in the committee report file, there is a BCC report that has 
number one, a link to the life, life cycle scope schedule cost report. And also it has uh, two copies of two charts uh, from that report as a kind of a 50,000 foot level review. One is uh, related to cost. One is related to cost and one is related to schedule. And so please look at that and also if you can attend the BCC meeting, which is tentatively planned for April 14th, uh, to have a more detailed discussion of that report by Chris Sutton. And if you cannot do that, uh, at least submit comments or questions to me via email. And I think my email is in that BCC report as well, as I recall. So please, please keep that in mind. We won't be discussing that this meeting but we will be covering it in detail at the BCC meeting coming up. So your comments are welcome and we appreciate them. Thanks. All right. Steve, are there other announcements? Not that I'm aware of. I'm just curious about the Tom's conversation, does that mean that one of these pieces of advice isn't going to be discussed today? No, no, this is not related to advice at all. It's related to an open public comment period of the life cycle scope schedule cost report. It's not oh, tied okay. to these these okay. advice items. Gotcha, gotcha. I have, I, I'm not aware of any announcements. Uh, we've got a very full day, so I'd kind of like to get started. Ryan, are you with us? Ryan Bell? Yes, I am. Thank you. All right. Let me show this. And as long as you can hear me, I'm ready to start. All right. All right. Slides are up. Yep. And we will do it. Okay, great. So th thank you all. Uh, as always, I appreciate the opportunity uh, to, to provide the Department of Energy update on our Hanford mission. Um, we're at an exciting inflection point in our cleanup, so I hope that my remarks today set the tone and conditions for some positive and constructive sessions over the next two days. Um, as we begin, I think it is important to highlight that it was literally two years ago today, on the 23rd of March 2020, when the department and our contractor partners reduced site operations in response uh, to the pandemic. Almost overnight, we effectively and efficiently transitioned thousands of members of our Hanford team to a new telework environment to continue to progress the mission from home. We also sent most of our on-site workforce home with full pay so they could continue to take care of their families and support the community while we worked to develop an understanding of the new environment. She goes, yeah, she goes, I told um, Jackson because he can't. Someone's got to be muted. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to mute Thank everybody. You. All right, I'm back if you're ready to go. I think I'm back, yes. So um, as we as we think thought about at that point um, the, the future of the site, we also recognized that we had a obligation to maintain the safety and the security of the site. So even during the period of reduced operations, which lasted over two months, there were more than a thousand members of our team who reported to the site each workday uh, while the department and our contractor teammates were setting conditions for their health and safety and in parallel planning for the re-entry of additional workers to support the needs of the site. Uh, just over two months later, on the 26th of May, 2020, we began an incremental and methodical process to return targeted groups of workers back into the workplace on a week by week basis based on the needs of the site and COVID conditions in our community. Um, I think it's important to recognize the exceptional effort by the Hammer Training Center, whose team worked to set conditions to begin training in a very new environment within days of our start of reentry in May of 2020. I think our first training class was on the 28th of May, two days after we reentered, um, to maintain worker qualifications and certifications without interruption in line with our commitment to make safety our, our top priority at the Hanford site. Uh, by the end of September of 2020, we returned all of our non 
portable or on work um, on on site workers back to the workplace. Roughly 60% of our team, while the remainder continue to support the mission through telework. Um, our goal from the beginning of the pandemic was to establish the safest possible workplace for our workforce. And we continuously reviewed guidance from federal, state, and local health officials and our site needs as the basis for our approach. Uh, beyond the needs of our site, we also engaged uh, with our local community leaders and our healthcare community to ensure we had a clear understanding of the community conditions as we made operational decisions over the subsequent two years. And we've been challenged in many ways, not only by the pandemic, but also by the inefficiencies inherent in a max telework environment, uh, supply chain issues, at times unclear or inconsistent guidance, and a host of other challenges that were unique to the pandemic um, as we worked as a leadership team to effectively and safely manage our workforce of, of roughly 10,000 people. Um, by working together um, as a DOE and contractor team, we continue to navigate through challenges and find ways to progress projects and activities. Even though all have been impacted by COVID, we were still able to continue to move our mission forward while also supporting the community. Uh, last week on the 14th of May, we re-entered the last wave of federal employees into our new hybrid workplace. And our contractors are continuing to evolve their workplace routines as well. Um, I've assessed that we're now operating in the first stage of the new normal for our, our work environment for the Hanford team, both DOE and contractors. And we'll continue to make adjustments um, as we learn more about uh, how we work together and, and strive for efficiency, uh, but also as the, the site needs continue to evolve. And so we've been very clear that we are starting a process that will evolve over time with our, with our Hanford team, um, because at the end of the day, we really do have an important mission to progress here. I think we've demonstrated our ability to do that. And as the pandemic wanes, hopefully for the last time, and with the weather improving, um, I really do believe we're poised for um, an exceptional period of progress um, based on what we've been able to accomplish during truly challenging times and, and really to build upon what we've accomplished together to set a new trajectory for the cleanup at the Hanford site. Um, if you go to the next site or next slide, um, I'm sure that most of you have seen this view of the Hanford site before, so I won't spend time much to cover the picture or the words. Um, I think it's important to highlight that the sole reason that the Department of Energy and our contractor partners are here is to progress the cleanup mission in the safest and most effective way within the funds appropriated by Congress for our use. Um, periodically, I think it's helpful to step back and take a bigger picture view of our site so I'll spend a couple of minutes really to talk about what's been accomplished over the last few years, which includes period before the pandemic as well by our, our clearly very talented and dedicated Department of Energy and contractor team. So we'll start with the tank waste mission. Um, in the tank farms, we completed all of the tank farm upgrades and the design construction testing and readiness, readiness activities for the tank site seed removal system. And since late January, we've treated just under 200,000 gallons of tank waste that is now positioned for the waste treatment plant. Uh, right now, we're working through our first ion exchange column change out. The first column was actually safely moved to the storage pad yesterday. Another first for the Hanford team uh, where we'll continue to learn and optimize our processes and procedures. And we remain on track to stage a million gallons uh, by the end of the calendar year clearly before the waste treatment plant is ready to begin uh, vitrification operations for tank waste uh, later next year. At the waste treatment plant in 2021 alone, we completed all of the DF law construction activities for direct feedlot activity waste and all the startup activities as well. And we transitioned fully into commissioning last fall with the first integrated plant test, the loss of power, loss of, loss of offsite power test which was success, successfully completed um, last October. Today, the waste treatment plant facilities are being operated by trained and fully qualified crews. Construction attire has been replaced by operating plant attire within the confines of the direct feed activity waste portion of the waste treatment plant. And the team is building operational proficiency while working through prerequisite activities to set conditions for the start 
of the first melter heat up later this year. Um, at the effluent treatment facility, um, a series of outages was has been successfully completed over the last few years. And early this month, we completed a campaign of roughly 1 million gallons to test the newly installed systems and equipment um, with very positive results. Now the facility is transitioning into the final outage to install the last set of equipment that will, that will be necessary to support direct feed low activity waste operations next year. Work is also resuming toward the completion of the fourth liquid effluent retention facility basin and the integrated disposal facility has completed most of the construction activ activities is nearly complete with leachate tank liner replacements and remains on track to be ready to support DF law operations uh, next year as well. Um, we're also progressing important site infrastructure work. Uh, we're constructing the new water plant in the 200 West area and we've got an ongoing project with the Bonneville Power Administration to enhance reliability of our on-site electrical distribution system. Um, and we're continuing to look at our site utilities um, relative to reliability to support site operations, which include direct feed low activity waste um, operations as we go forward. While the site-wide machine is also um, moving forward, um, we're also working and continuing to strengthen our site operations-based culture which is on a very positive trajectory to support 24-7, 365 operations uh, as the plant and the systems all required to support direct feed low activity waste come together over the next year to two years. Beyond the tank waste mission, there's also been tremendous progress in our site risk reduction projects. We completed stabilization of the two Purex tunnels after a partial collapse. Then by leveraging that event, uh, to execute a site-wide risk assessment, we stabilized two additional underground structures and verified a third was not a risk in the vicinity of the plutonium finish plant, finishing plant uh, to eliminate risk to the workforce and the community. We've completed the plutonium, plutonium finishing plant, not only the project, but the paperwork. Um, after many years, and we're proud to have that project behind us, we've treated over 2 billion gallons of groundwater each year the last seven years, removing contaminants and reducing risk to the Columbia River. Um, we're also continuing to monitor contamination um, and actively manage wells to maximize the effic efficiency and effectiveness of the groundwater program um, as cleanup continues. And this year we've already passed, surpassed 1 billion gallons treated and we're well on our way to 2 billion gallons already. Um, we've moved um, sludge and filter media from K Basin to set conditions for actions in the uh, dispose of the debris and ultimately dewater the basin and continue the remediation and demolition of the activities around the K West reactor. Uh, we've progressed demolition activities around K East, placed all four foundations for the safe storage enclosure. Uh, backfill is currently in progress this week, and we expect to begin construction on that enclosure uh, next month. Uh, we've progressed the design, fabrication, mock-up, and we've worked with uh, in, uh, to establish construction activities to set conditions to transfer nearly 2,000 cesium and strontium capsules to safe storage. And we've made significant progress in placing micro piles for the 324 building in parallel with setting conditions inside of the facility for eventually removing the floor, um, remediating that waste site, and setting conditions to demolish the facility in the later part of the decade. Um, and we've retrieved three of the four AX farm tanks, and we're preparing to start the fourth retrieval, the last tank in the AX farm uh, later this year. And, and those are the projects. There are also many other activities, including controlled tumbleweed burns, surveillance and monitoring activities, road maintenance, water, sewer, electrical distribution, and IT systems management, uh, training for our, our Hanford workforce, and many other activities safely executed by our dedicated team to continue to progress the mission across our 580 square mile site uh, on behalf of the nation's taxpayers. So overall, really an impressive period of performance and progress safely delivered. Um, and I think it's it's important to highlight that much of that work I just talked about was accomplished during the pandemic, which I think adds another layer of um, degree of difficulty and certainly um, highlights the effectiveness of our team during challenging times. Uh, next slide. Um, the DOE contractor team, past and present, I'm hopeful was very proud of what's been accomplished at the Hanford site. Um, I was able to participate in person in the Waste Management Symposium earlier this month, 
And while Hanford was not a featured site, there was really a positive buzz around the conference regarding um, our site and our team, which I know is gratifying for our DOE and contractor teammates that were in attendance, and I just hope it was gratifying for others um, in our community that were also there. Um, as the site owner and the customer to our contractors, um, our DOE team is dedicated to being a great customer uh, based on the recognition that when safe, efficient, and effective cleanup progress is delivered reliably, consistently, and ethically by our contractor partners, we're maximizing the value um, that we receive from the taxpayer dollars entrusted for our use. Over the last two years, we've worked with our contractor partners through numerous challenges, all in uncharted waters, uh, to establish and maintain the healthiest possible workplace for our, work post, our, our workforce so we could safely continue to deliver the progress. Uh, beyond the pandemic and the physical progress that I described, we've consistently worked closely with our contractor partners to find ways to create const constructive um, and positive uh, site culture within a strong partnership focused on safety and delivery of value. And while a partnership between a customer and a contractor is never quite equal because of our different roles and responsibilities, we, the department, are committed to striving to create exceptional outcomes as a DOE and contractor team. But together, we focused on maturing our teamwork and communications, our safety culture, our ethics culture and standards, our site governance process to streamline decisions and actions, while also, also working together to build a hand force, uh, Hanford workforce of the future. Specifically, we conducted a joint, our first joint Hanford recruiting event earlier in this month focused on um, selling our important mission, but also highlighting and selling our community to build awareness and interest. And the event was very promising. We had over 2,000 people sign up, over 1,500 completed the full registration, and over 1,100 attended and met with DOE and contractor representatives over a several hour event that was just conducted in a single day. 44% uh, of those, discuss those discussions were with people from outside of our local area. And frankly, we exceeded expectations. We would have been pleased if we had 500 participants based on what we've seen around the country. Um, and our team was really pleased with getting more than 2,000 uh, interests. Uh, Val McCain already mentioned this week uh, during other meetings that we had with her that she's seen an increase in applications for positions at the waste treatment plant and WTCC. So I think we've already, we're already seeing some of those benefits. And while we'll continue to track the results based on the number um, we hire, it came through that pipeline. Um, for even those that we don't capture, there's now more people who know about the site and our community who we may consider uh, who may consider future opportunities here as well. So I think that's positive um, indication of the of the impact this 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 event could could likely have for us. Um, we've already started planning our next event uh, later this year, building on the recent success and really to identify additional opportunities for not only improvement, but also increased participation. Um, for those of you who live in the Tri-Cities, I hope the commitment of the department and our contractor partners to the Hanford community is very evident. We recognize our responsibility to safeguard people, our workforce, our families, and, and certainly our community because we live here too. Uh, beyond the direct financial benefits to the community that roughly $2.6 billion a year provide we also recognize that our work ensures that the industries in this region, agriculture, wine, the river, and all businesses um, really continue to prosper um, because even a very small loss of control of one of the hazards we're responsible to manage can call into question nearly every activity in Proct in our region. Uh, we take that responsibility, responsibility very seriously and the product of our work as a DOE contractor team um, the safe and cost-effective cleanup progress of the site reduces risks to our workforce, our community, and the environment of the Pacific Northwest. Um, we'll continue to build on the very positive momentum of the last few years. Um, I, I hope both of both our workforce and our community can view with pride what has been accomplished, and we'll continue to strive to achieve a Hanford team culture where every success is a team success shared equally by every every member of our workforce of 10,000 dedicated professionals. Uh, given what we've accomplished over the last few years, I'm very confident that we can build on that momentum and to continue to accomplish very impactful progress 
on what I think is clearly the most complex environmental cleanup in our nation um, and what we've built upon what we've safely been able to deliver um, during the during the recent challenging times. Uh, next slide. Uh, it, I think you've seen some a representation of this before. We've tailored it a little bit more, but you'll see an over, overview of our Sanford site engagement arena, which I consider this is really the simplified view because many of the wedges you see on this chart um, have sub wedges. Um, but I hope you recognize that our engagement, our engagement landscape, and our commitment to engagement um, is really very broad, diverse, and complex. Uh, we continue to make routine and constructive engagement across this broad spectrum of stakeholders in our tribal nations a priority for our leadership team and our entire team. Our goal is to hand, enhance the knowledge of our work, current and future, and build relationships anchored on an assumption of noble intent and trust to enable concerns and perspectives to be shared and discussed constructively. We've continued to demonstrate our commitment to engagement throughout the pandemic through use of virtual means. Um, and at the highest level, I believe that there is general alignment across this arena of a cleaner and safer Hanford site. But as you can imagine, an effort as significant as our cleanup, um, there are many broad and diverse perspectives on nearly every aspect of our work, and our engagement is intended to support those discussions. An important reality that is not always appreciated is that we operate in a fiscally constrained environment, which means that there is always more work to be done than we're funded to deliver. That is not to say that Congress doesn't do a great job for us, because they really do. Um, if you look at our combined FY 2022 budget that was just issued, um, it's the largest budget in our cleanup history at nearly $2.7 billion, which provides a tremendous opportunity for progress that we will work hard to deliver. However, given fiscal constraints, we must establish risk-based cleanup priorities and plans that maximize risk reduction per dollar invested. Some tend to focus nearly exclusively on the environmental aspect of the cleanup, which is necessary but not sufficient. The department and our contractor partners certainly care about the environment and the cleanup, pro cleanup progress that has been delivered safely over the last 30 years um, has reduced the hazards significantly that the Hanford site represents. However, the department and our contractor partners are uniquely accountable for the health and safety of people, both our workforce and our community, and we are absolutely committed to, to the safety and health of people as our top priority. A situation where the department is driven to spend limited funds in ways that do not optimize risk reduction per dollar, the health and safety of our workforce and our community can both be impacted. Immediately and in the future, simply put, people are less safe. There are also cases when risk reduction actions short of final cleanup objectives are necessary and appropriate to mitigate hazards for our team and our community. The stabilization of the underground cribs and vaults in the vicinity of the former PFP facility provide a, a good example of funds spent on a time critical action to enhance the safety of our team while not impeding future cleanup activities. There's a topic tomorrow that was already mentioned in uh, the opening comments about portfolio risk management that I hope will be helpful in gaining, uh, providing some additional insights into the process we use to manage risks that site, at the site level, um, anchored first and always on the safety of people. Um, our leadership team is consistently engaged with um, very many of the wedges you see on this chart, including our local community elected officials, uh, local health district, uh, local and industry business leaders, local and regional um, elected officials and state representatives, state and national regulatory agencies, um, officials from Washington and Oregon, members of Congress and congressional staff, um, tribal nations, and at times international agencies to gain as many insights as possible that will enable us to progress our important cleanup mission uh, and risk reduction efforts as successfully as possible with as broad a support as we can achieve given the broad range of perspectives that come to the Hanford site. Um, as we leverage outreach activities like the FY24 prior work, priority workshops just conducted earlier this month with the regulators, with the tribes, and with the public, um, we've received inputs that assist in shaping best possible decisions uh, and actions in a fiscally constrained environment. 
um, as an additional means of community engagement. Um, as you all know, the department has established community advisory boards at EM sites across the complex. Uh, EM specific um, site specific advisory boards were created to involve affected communities more directly in EM, EM cleanup decisions in recognition that when members of the community uh, share their opinions and become involved in the cleanup decisions, federal decision making and cleanup activities are improved. For discuss discussion to be most uh, of most value for all involved, the membership must reflect the affected community, providing a seat at the table and an equal voice for those most directly impacted by the department's work. Policy level advice and priority input inputs assist the department in making decisions that are cost effective, uh, community specific, and environmentally sound, which ultimately leads to faster and safer cleanup with greater support. The department and our site contractors are committed to providing information to community boards in a manner that every member of the board can understand and explain to their constituents, regardless of their history on the, on the board. Um, principal aspect of an effective and impactful community board, board is the engagement uh, by members of the board outside of the board meetings with represented constituencies to achieve meaningful community engagement that leads to advice that is forward-looking constructive and actionable. Um, as I hope I've conveyed not only today, but in meetings over the last few years, our Hanford site is on a very positive trajectory and has reached an important inflection point um, as we approach a new chapter in the Hanford cleanup mission. I believe the Hanford Advisory Board is also an important crossroads as well. Over the last 30 years, our site has evolved, our mission has evolved, our DOE and contractor team has evolved, our Hanford community has evolved in many, many ways. Now, I believe that it is also necessary for the HAB to evolve as a precondition to achieving the benefits that community advisory boards are expected and capable of delivering uh, in a cleanup as complex and challenging as the Hanford site cleanup. I'm hopeful that during the meetings today and tomorrow and over the coming weeks and months, the current HAB membership will periodically step back and take a look objectively at the Hanford site and our community of today and the future as a break from the site and the community of the past. We are at a point of tremendous promise for the cleanup, which has taken a long time to achieve, and members of, of the Hanford Advisory Board have been a part of that. At times, while change is often difficult, change is often an important catalyst for next level performance. When looking, um, when operating on a playing field, that has fundamentally changed. New, fresh, forward-looking perspectives brought into a collaborative environment that support full participation by every member uh, of, the, of the board in an environment of noble intent would be energizing and impactful to all. While we've come a long way in our site mission and the site is safer in many, many ways than when the startup cleanup, the cleanup journey started more than three decades ago, um, we really all have a common enemy that those that are associated with the Hanford cleanup must acknowledge, and that's time. Our site is aging, so there must be deliberate sense of urgency to move the mission forward by building on our momentum over the last few years and embracing safe opportunities for acceleration. Achieving alignment on maximizing risk reduction per dollar at the site level in a fiscally constrained environment focused first on keeping people safe is critical. A Hanford advisory board that looks like our Hanford community that is focused on working with the department and our contractors in an environment of mutual trust based on an assumption of noble intent that considers the whole site perspective while acknowledging site fiscal realities that embraces the need to achieve successful cleanup outcomes through policy level advice that is constructive, actionable, and places a strong emphasis on identifying and implementing opportunities for acceleration of the mission will maximize the benefits of a community board um, that can contribute in a ways that are impactful and positive for the complex mission that we have in front of us. Our, our, our Hanford community and our cleanup effort would benefit from that type of a Hanford advisory board as we enter the next phase of our important mission. Uh, please go to the next slide. Um, there's a couple of slides here on the Justice 40 initiative. I'll just get, provide a preamble um, and you'll provide, you'll be pro uh, provided these slides to look more in detail. But at a very high level, the Justice 40 initiative was established by the Office of Management and Budget in July of 2021 in response to the President's commitment 
and is designed to specifically drive certain federal investments in covered activities that might be made with an additional goal of 40% of the overall benefits of such, of such investments benefiting disadvantaged communities. Um, covered communities at Hanford are focused on in one or more of the following areas, clean energy and energy efficiency, uh, clean transportation, uh, training and workforce development, remediation and reduction of legacy pollution, and critical clean water and waste infrastructure. Um, the Hanford Soil and Groundwater Program is a focus area of this initiative, obviously, um, and we're hoping to gain better visibility to successful path forward based on efforts at Los Alamos, uh, which was chosen as a pilot um, for selection and benefits of, of this effort. Um, we'll engage and solicit feedback as this process continues um, and as there's a firmer development of a strategic vision as a means of developing and delivering environmental justice um, in and around the Hanford site. So just, just go ahead and forward uh, to the DF law picture. And again, these, these slides will be available to you and you can review those and ask questions later in the agenda. Um, I really like this presentation of the direct fuel activity waste portion uh, of our site and mission because I think it reflects an operating environment um, that really does depend on a new level of support and site level teamwork. Um, the view is really is contributing to prove helpful in assisting us to communicate the cultural shift that we're making as a Hanford site team to 24 seven operations. Um, and that's really a transfer transformational change for our site. And, and I mentioned most of the activities on this site uh, on this representation. So I won't talk about those today, but I, I think it is important to continue to look at this representation of the trans transformation we're making with the Hanford site over the, over the next two years. And it, it, it is truly a cultural shift that we're on a positive track to achieve, but we'll take continuous focus by our leadership team, uh, both the department and our contractors to achieve together. Uh, next slide. Um, I've also talked about some of the, the larger projects in, in my previous comments relative to progress that we're making across the site. But I think it's also important periodically to talk about those enabling activities uh, that do not always get the visibility, um, but are worth highlighting because they're key enablers to how we conduct our work. So one good example, again, not pictured here, um, is a collaboration of the workforce uh, with our contractors um, that to install a new change uh, tent now uh, in the vicinity of the AY farm that can safely accommodate up to 80 workers at a time with areas for changing into or out of personal protective equipment, warming up or cooling down, swapping out supplied air, uh, and performing radiological surveys, and all, all designed uh, with COVID in mind. So we're really proud of that. I think it's gonna develop some, uh, it's gonna enhance the work efficiencies and contribute to uh, worker safety as we progress the, the mission in that area of the tank farms in the in 200 East. Um, important to our site and safety and security. The Hanford Patrol recently swore in 16 new officers and the Hanford Fire Department welcomed two, 12 new firefighters. So we're continuing to recruit, train um, next generation of workers for Hanford Patrol and Hanford Fire as well. Uh, in the world of infrastructure, I've already talked about a lot of the activities that we're doing from a project perspective, um, but we're also working to stage water system projects, road projects, and other facility projects. Um, should there at some point be additional funds uh, available, we wanna have those projects on the shelf and ready to execute um, rapidly, and those are the types of projects that generally benefit from stimulus funding. We're looking ahead and getting those projects on the shelf to be ready to execute if we get the opportunity. We've also updated emergency alerting equipment to provide um, primary and backup coverage, including sirens and phones and computers and radios, uh, activated for emergency notifications um, used by our Hanford Patrol and our Hanford Fire Department. And at the Tank Farms team, they're closing in on the completion of construction of a new maintenance facility that will enhance the working conditions for carpenters, electricians, pipe fitters, and other trades that support um, the work in the tank farms, which I will believe will boost morale, efficiency, and also teamwork. And, and if you take a little bit of a bigger picture, as we look towards the end of the decade and the picture of our Hanford site in the future, I think it's truly exciting. We'll be optimizing DF law operations, creating more tank space through treatment and final disposition of tank waste. We'll be progressing the construction and treatment capability for the high level waste fraction of our tank wastes. Along the river corridor, the two, 324 building will be demolished and work at 100K will be complete and the 
the, the last two reactors on the river um, in the 100K area will be in interim safe storage. In the central plateau, cesium and strontium capsules will all be in dry storage. We'll be um, progressing our transuranic waste program. It will be in operation, shipping waste to the waste isolation pilot plant. Um, we also hope to be leveraging new technologies and approaches to accelerate our mission, further reducing the environmental liability that the site represents. We'll continue to identify and execute risk reduction projects to protect our workforce and our community. And we'll continue to build tailored infrastructure needed to support decades of cleanup that are still in front of us. Um, and we'll continue to develop and implement training programs uh, while we continue to recruit and the next generation of our site workforce um, and site leaders continuing to serve um, as, and while we continue to serve as active and engaged members of our Tri-Cities community. And lastly, um, we'll continue to use lessons learned both from here and across the complex uh, to continue to strengthen our strong um, site culture of safety, our ethical standards, our teamwork, our commitment to project and program delivery excellence, while continuing to constructively engage within our entire engagement arena, arena to build support that is so critical to our success and our future funding. Uh, building on our trajectory of our team and site today, I hope that you can each see the tremendous opportunities for progress that are within our grasp. And our workforce of um, 10,000 people aligned and working together as a unified team to maximize risk reduction per dollar um, and with the broad support uh, of our entire engagement arena is the best means of safely progressing our mission, efficiently reducing the hazards that the Hanford re re site represents, and will continue to make the site investment worthy for congressional members who are, are you know, challenged with funding needs from across the country. Uh, go, to the go to the last slide. Um, while we continue to face challenges in our complex cleanup mission, uh, again, I'm very optimistic about our future uh, of our team and the trajectory of our site. I hope that you also recognize that the FY22 budget is a strong indicator of the confidence that our DOE and contractor team has earned with our congressional delegation through delivery of safe progress and taxpayer value, despite the challenging times we faced. Um, now that conditions support, I hope that you will each consider uh, a site tour in the future to get a firsthand view of what we've accomplished and the significant changes of the site over the past few years. And beyond the physical pro progress, I hope you also watch and look for that positive energy that a successful organization um, sort of manifests across our entire talented uh, and dedicated Hanford team. So I, I appreciate the opportunity to provide the update today. Um, thanks for your attention. I look forward to questions uh, when we reach that point in the agenda. And I'll turn it back to Ruth. You're muted, Ruth. Ruth we can't hear you. Talking to myself. Okay. Um, you can hear me now, right? Yes. Hear you. Okay. All right. So we'll check in with EPA and then Ecology, and then we'll open up to questions. Um, I will check in with the folks on the phone. We have about four folks on the phone to see if they have questions. If you have a question or a comment, let me know in the chat and I'll keep a list. And we will do our best to check in with everybody who has a, a question or a comment for any of our tri-party agreement agencies. So, Dave, Enid? Good morning. Um, I really appreciate you all being here today and taking this time. Um, as Brian and Steve have both said, it is important work. Uh, and and. I keep saying I appreciate it and I very much do. Um, I'll keep my my piece quite short. Um, I do want to also. Commend Brian and and his workforce 
and what they've been able to accomplish, how much of the mission they've been able to accomplish in these in the last two years. Um, it really is remarkable. Um, in terms of of returning to work, uh, EPA is you know it's somewhat location dependent just because of local conditions, but but for for me it'll be starting to transition into to returning to the to the office next week, um, and my my staff will be starting in the the first week of May that that return. Hope to be able to, you know, look forward to be able to have some some in person meetings again. That would it, it's going to be very novel and and a lot better. Including, you know, hopefully we'll be able to to have at least hybrid um, have meetings in the future. Um, the 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 other thing that I wanted to touch on is is Dewey recently sent us the draft final. Uh, five year circle of five year rod review, and I believe the briefing for that is scheduled for the HAB in June. So, again, thank you for being here and and looking forward to, to the next couple of days. Thank you. So, I've got, I've got a list of folks who are in our questions queue. Before we do that, let's check in with Ecology. David Bowen. Good morning, thank you, Ruth, and thanks everybody for being here as well. Um, I'm gonna go through my, my, my normal um, summary and then uh, have a few comments that I wanna probably add at the end, but so um, go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, for an outline, I'm going to talk about recruitment, outreach and education, holistic negotiations, the tri-party agreement compliance activities, and then where we are with compliance and permitting activities. Next slide. So under recruitment, um, we've filled eight positions since our last update, uh, and we have 14 active recruitments underway, uh, once again in various stages of the hiring process, whether there's an offer made or reference checks, interviews, recruitment posted, whatever it might be. And uh, I just can't emphasize enough how important this recruitment and getting these positions filled is for knowledge transfer and mentoring the next generation of our team and, and, and how critical that is to long term success. Um, I had a chance to see uh, a preview of the pilot project at Los Alamos um, on Justice 40. Uh, Nicole Nelson John led that panel down at the Waste Management Symposia. Excited to find ways for us to collaborate with the federal agencies in, in your efforts to implement Justice 40, and it aligns really well uh, with Ecology's Environmental Justice and Diversity Initiatives. Next slide. Outreach and education over the last few months. Um, Ginger Wireman uh, spent science night in Yakima at Washington Middle School, talked to about 75 students, teachers, and parents, uh, trying to get people thinking about um, the Hanford site and careers that might be on site. Um, also taught at, uh, at StemCon at Delta High School, where there were 10 9th and 10th grade students uh, in attendance. And then upcoming, we have the Salmon Summit, uh, April 26th and 27th, and we may need some volunteers. So if you're interested, please reach out to Ginger and, and uh, she can give you some details on how you might be able to help. Uh, next slide. This one's always brief, and I know everybody's anxious for the holistic negotiations to be done, and nobody's more anxious than I am. Uh, we are making good progress and um, really appreciate the transparent and open discussions we've been having and um, we're going to be getting together soon, um, you know, face to face now that things have, have uh, loosened up a little bit with the COVID and uh, spend some more quality time together to really hash out some details. And the devil's always in the details, as you know. Um, compliance activities, next slide. We conducted inspections at the Fast Flux test facility and then also in a variety of ditches, cribs, trenches, ponds, um, evaporation date, basins, etc. over this uh, last three month period. And next slide, um, we also completed some compliance reports. We issued ones for the 22S laboratory complex, the single shell tank system, the low level burial ground trenches 31 and 34, 
uh, LERF ETF facility, and then the Hanford Mission Integrated Solutions and Bechtel National Accumulation Areas as well. Next slide. So inspection goal performance. Um, you know, I, I wish I could say that we were we were keeping pace right now. We we are for our five year performance partnership agreement, uh, but we've had uh, some turnover and some loss of inspectors. And we did reach out to um, other programs within ecology and have got some assistance um, uh, from a, some different programs. And so I think we're going to be able to catch up on some of these inspections while we fill these vacant and vacant positions and get get them up to speed on you know the tasks of the positions. But um, you can see the, the inspections continue to go on um, from a five year perspective. We're, we're well ahead of what you know what we need to be for a target to be on schedule. So I'm excited to see that. And then I realize there's an acronym on this slide and it's been on here since I've been here that isn't in the acronym list at the end. So TSDF is treatment storage and or disposal facility is what that stands for on this particular slide. Uh, next slide. We have several um, public comment periods running right now and uh, class two modif permit modifications are a majority of them. There's two that are open and active now for the LERF ETF and 242A. And then uh, in late March, I guess uh, next week, we have two more that'll be opening up once again for LERF ETF. Um, most, almost, uh, probably 99% of all of these modifications are in support of DF law or their supporting facilities. Uh, so really important for us to continue these moving forward, working closely with the contractors and Department of Energy on keeping that schedule moving. Um, and next slide, we have some class three permit modifications that are coming up in July and then uh, one that we have to we haven't uh, determined yet when we'll be ready to announce that. But sometime, you know, in this coming year, six to six months or so. Um, and they're everything from the integrated disposal facility to um, FFTF and uh, some new infrastructure projects, uh, upgrades, et cetera, uh, across the site. And then the last one on here is a modification for the construction of LERF Basin 41 and operation of the LERF bases to receive DF law affluent. Once again, supporting uh, infrastructure for the DF law facility. Uh, the next slide is my acronyms legend. So if you get a chance later uh, to look at the presentation, uh, you, you can get an idea of what some of these acronyms that are just proliferated through everything that we do, it seems. Um, and then if you want to comment on uh, the last slide, if you want to comment on any of the uh, permit modifications, et cetera, that are out, uh, you can go to our website to do that. You can follow us uh, on Facebook or Twitter. And I'm assuming that's Instagram at the bottom. I am not tech <laughs> technology proficient. Um, and so that was my, my planned um, presentation. Uh, I do want to talk about there was some great energy at the Waste Management Symposium. Uh, I do want to reinforce that that is going on, and um, as Brian mentioned, it was it was a great uh, great event. Um, although Hanford wasn't uh, wasn't featured, uh, I think they were in the past. Um, there was a lot of discussion about all the activity going there, and people really looking forward to uh, to the plant DF law coming online. Um, I was really interested to hear about the joint recruitment event. I was curious if there's a place for ecology maybe to join in that next round. If not, I understand if there is, we'd love to coordinate with you on that. Um, and then I think um, I think I'll end with, you know, Laura Watson and I and Charlotte Mina, her special assistant, went to Washington, D.C. Um, we first time in two years that ecology has been back. We visited with you know, appropriations committees. We visited with um, congressional congressional members and their staff. Um, also stopped in. We were one of the first people to actually go into the Department of Energy facility after they opened up for in-person visits. Um, had great conversations. Um, heard some things we needed to hear. Also um, had reinforcement of the support that Brian mentioned earlier of our congressional delegation trying to get funding uh, for the site and. Um, you know, it's when I think of the Hanford team culture, I, I think of the contractors ourselves, Department of Energy, EPA, um, you know, and, and HAB is, is, is kind of poking us in certain places with policy on those things. So I, I think of, us, of that as being all of us. And then I 
really keyed in on the acceleration of the mission. I understand risk-based work and all of that. Um, and what I came back with from Washington, D.C. is I think there are opportunities to influence that fiscal constraint that we have. And I think it's not just a it's just not it's not just a regular regulator perspective and a blind push for more funding that I'm coming from. I think the community is recognizing the issue uh, and I, I would point to um, Annette Carey's article on uh, February 1st about uh, the Hanford Life Cycle Scope Schedule and Cost Report. Uh, just some basic math indicates that um, spending at Hanford will peak in about eight years, about 7.5 billion if you follow that report, and uh, nearly, which is nearly triple the amount we have right now. I'm not saying we can get the triple amount we have right now, but I think we do need to, to tell a story as a unified community. Um, we have some good information available now that really lays out what the long-term cost of this would be, what different durations might be, and um, I think one of the last things that um, Annette Carey put in her article was spending would be above $4 billion from 2023 to 2069, according to projections. So that's a real that's a real thing we need to try and figure out. And um, I'm hoping to continue working with, um, you know, internally here at Ecology, but expand that out into the community and work with, um, you know, the Tridex and the Hanford Challenges and the Art of Americas and, and um, the cities and county commissioners, et cetera, to kind of have a unified message about Hanford, tell the story based on the data that's collected, the data we know, and um, find a path forward that um, can accelerate the mission, understand and recognize fiscal constraints, but try and see if we can find ways to make that part bigger. And I'll stop there. Thanks. All right. <clears throat> so before we move to questions, um, I want to let folks know if you're looking for copies of the presentations, we post all of the meeting documents at Hanford.gov under the Hanford Advisory Board uh, portion of that website. I put the link in chat. Um, there's also a link in chat from Roberto Armijo from EPA to the CERCLA five-year review. Um, if you have any trouble finding those documents, um, feel to reach out to the facilitation team at hab at slind.net, that's h-a-b at s-l-i-n-d.net. We would be happy to help you find those documents so you can look back over things like presentations and photographs and those sorts of things. So that. I've got four folks on the phone. Does anyone on the phone have a question or a comment? I want to make sure you get in the queue if you have a something you want to ask. Anyone from the phone? All right. We will check in again with you because um, I don't want to leave you out. Um, I have Liz, Steve Wigman, Esteban, and Pam um, in the queue. If you want to ask a question, let me know in chat and we will make sure you get on the list. Liz, you're up. Thanks, Ruth. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Great. Um, thanks for the presentations um, and the opportunity to ask questions. I was intrigued, um, Brian, about you talking about making the site investment worthy. And I'm curious to hear from you what that means to you. Um, and also just in the context of what David just shared, I really like the framing you, you ended with about trying to find a unified message. I, I don't think we have one right now, but I, I would be really excited for an effort to do that, um, to bring more money to the Hanford site and be able to meet the projections in the life cycle report. Um, but just to for a response, I would love to hear um, maybe from all three of you, um, what, what making the Hanford site investment worthy means to you. Um, if we could go through each agency, that would be great. Thanks. Well, I'll, I'll lead off. Um, you know, at the macro level, what uh, our objective on a daily basis is deliver safe, efficient, effective cleanup progress on schedule, on or under budget, consistently, um, and, and doing it in a way that we can clearly demonstrate risk reduction value for the dollars we invest, 
and do it in an ethical environment where our contractors are performing the work um, ethically. And, and really, we have exceptional contractors. Um, we have to be an exceptional customer to get the most out of those contractors to deliver the mission. And, and what I'm trying to do at the macro level is make it as easy as possible because of the progress safely being delivered at the Hanford site for Congressman Newhouse and Senators Cantwell and Murray and the Washington delegation to go compete for funds on our behalf. Um, I believe in the virtuous circle philosophy of federal funding, which means if an organization and a team is consistently delivering positive results every year, that garners support from the community, it garners support from um, you know, the entire stakeholder arena, and that support directly translates to goodwill in Congress. Goodwill in Congress translates to funding, and then the, the process continues. Um, I think at the macro level, again, the best situation we're in is when the department, um, the state, EPA, our community, and our region, our tribes are all aligned in the work that's being done at the Hanford site. And that alignment from a outside perspective looking in, I think creates an investment worthy uh, environment for congressional funding to be maximized. Um, you know, we're part of the administration. If I got a dollar, I would do my very best with one dollar to progress the mission. We can get a lot done with $2.7 billion and we'll continue to do everything we can to progress that um, this, this mission in the most effective and efficient way. But that to me is what investment worthy is really all about. It's making sure that every dollar that comes here can demonstrate risk reduction value. We do it well, we do it repeatedly, we do it consistently and people outside looking in feel like their dollars will be well spent here. Hopefully that answers your question. Liz. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. And can we hear from um, EPA and Ecology too? Sure. I, I'm sorry. I, I, I unmuted first, so I'll go ahead and then Davian and please follow on behind. You know, I, I look back at my role when I was a county commissioner and I, I can echo what Brian said. If people are getting along, if you have multiple people pushing the same idea um, where you have uni unity, mm -hmm. I can't say we're going to have unity everywhere. We have different roles. We have different um, priorities, et cetera. But there are places we have unity. I've been in this role 15 months. Uh, 90, 95 percent of the activities that need to be done on site, we agree they need to be done. We have disagreements on technology and uh, maybe methods along with sequencing and duration, uh, but those things are are out. That's what's primarily in the media, and we need to we need to get back to the 90 percent that we agree on that needs to happen. Uh, and the way to do that to accelerate things is to come out with a voice of unity while acknowledging our differences, but uh, get that unity out. And I look at the Yakima Basin Integrated Plan as a, a good model for that. Where Bureau of Reclamation worked with ecology and then all of the stakeholders throughout the Yakima Basin region. And they go back and they've been successful at the state and they've been successful at the federal level uh, obtaining funding to progress that project. So uh, I agree. Um, as an elected official, it was really tough for me to fund somebody who was fighting with somebody and they couldn't come forward with a uh, with a unified message. Hey, Beenan. Yeah, I just I really kind of echo what what David and Brian have said that the, you know we all have this we have the same mission here um and and really I think we we need to get back to the realization that we all agree that like like David said 90 plus percent we agree agree on what has to be done that the work has to be done it's just a question of of when and the sequencing so mm -hmm. We need to be focusing on those things and 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 advancing those and talking about those. That needs to be the because that's the bulk of what we have to do. There's still the rest of it that we <coughs> that may have some tough decisions that we need to pull along, but and we have to acknowledge those. But we really do need to be focusing on. On the things that we agree on. 
Thank, thanks for that. Um, just, just to offer, I think that having this would be a great topic to create some kind of public process or forum for talking about what this means to different communities to see where the overlap of how do you present an investment worthy um, cleanup so that we can be on the same page. Um, so I think this will be a great topic for Pick to talk about more too. Thanks so much. Right. I have Steve Wigman and Esteban, you're on deck. Steve? Thank you very much. Um, I want to comment first that when I first came here in 1980 and walked on the site, I was pretty astonished. If I get the opportunity to walk on the site again soon, I will be pretty astonished, but differently. A huge progress has been made. And my focus in my little brain is risk to the human population and the environment, primarily the human population, doing the work and afterwards. I look to our grandchildren and what they're going to inherit. And I really strongly agree with the unified message. Um, and as an engineer, I would understand that message best if it had a risk reduction component. I can see when I look at pictures of the site that the risk is dramatically less than it used to be, but I don't know how much less. And I know that the activities that are being undertaken are being done to further reduce risk. And to tomorrow, we hope to begin to hear about how risk is used in decision making. And I recognize there's a lot of different types of risk and perceptions. But I, I strongly agree with the unified message idea and hope that we can evolve a way to actually understand it and not have it be just some form of spin on what we think the facts are. Um, but thank you so much for getting us uh, so far toward a much improved situation. And I'm confident that the progress will demonstrate that it's a good investment. That's all. So I've got Esteban, you're up, and then I have Pam and Jerry next. Esteban? Yes, thank you, Ruth. And uh, I'd like to acknowledge and thank the uh, energy DOE for, you know, meeting with tribal leaders and the communities to hear, the secretary to hear, you know, those community needs. And I think, you know, also thank the chair because I think when the first meeting I attended, he pointed out to, yeah, how, the young, you know, the young and the next generation, how this is going to look. And I think the first bullet point that I'd like to point out, and I think that um, it was mentioned by, you know, by DOE uh, about Bonneville. I think then Bonneville just get a designation. And I think maybe also EPA can weigh in on this about getting designated as a super fun site. And second, I think my second red flag that I saw was um about Hanford not being compared to like the work being done at Los Alamos and how we get the funding because I think for me that kind of stood out for a prior meeting. And then just finally, I think on the words to ecology and from David, I think, yeah, the big thing I think working on how do we do that outreach and I know Ginger has been doing great work is um me myself just, you know, talking to academics, especially like here in the WC Tri-Cities getting projects that do work and I think like Liz said about regarding how do we get out to these young and diverse communities to communicate what's happening at Hanford and the involvement so I think just the, the how the Bonneville and how I think we can promote Hanford and then finally third that unified message about just thoughts about what's happening you know with um with all those situations and just kind of elaborate a little bit more appreciate it thank you Um, Ginger Wireman has added um, a comment in chat for those of you who can't see it that the island below Bonneville Dam was recently added to Superfund for uh, PCB contamination. Bradford oh. Island is its name. Thank you. So, Pam, you're next, and Jerry, you're on deck. Pam? 
Thank you. Um, thank you for your presentations. Um, Brian, I'm, I'm, I'm just overwhelmed with the accomplishments um, at Hanford and, and the position we're at to start treating waste. I was very surprised with the number of federal agencies that you have to engage with. Um, that uh, is obviously time consuming and time off task. Um, so I, I'm happy to hear everyone saying that they, we need to focus on risk reduction, but also as Brian stated, um, work, the workers um, who live in our communities, um, we need to be very concerned about their health and safety. Um, and um, David Ripolog, who's the executive director of Hanford Communities is not able to be on the call today, but um, I wanted to express from the organization that I um, managed for 25 years and I'm retired from that the local elected officials every year have stressed cost effective cleanup. And I think that that has been discussed also in these presentations that we have to achieve um, a lot for the money that we're given in order to sustain it. 2.7 billion is so mind boggling to me. I just, I can hardly believe it. And I'm so excited about it. In um, the ecology presentation, I appreciated the terminology that the state needs to recognize constraints. And I, that's coded wording, I think, for um, it, it can't all be done perfectly as fast as everyone wants. We know that. And I would really encourage the three agencies to meet with the representatives, to meet with our congressional delegation together. So um, the senators would probably have to meet with individually, but I know Congressman Newhouse would be happy to do that. In terms of life cycle cost and where we're at and what's reasonable, and um, you know, if you pound the table and demand something that's not reasonable, the credibility that we've gained with cleanup um, it, is eroded. So um, I'm look at that 90 to 95 percent. Let's get on with it, and then we can put the other tasks on a list, and we'll get to them because look what's been done in the past 20 years. Congratulations and thank you. Jerry. Thank you. Thank you. I think, it, did I unmute properly? You're there. Okay, it didn't show. Okay, thanks. Um, uh, I have two questions. Uh, first, I want to uh, discuss about diversity and ask for an update on issue. And the second, has to do with the test bed initiative. Um, first, uh, we've discussed diversity and risk reduction, and of course, the people who are going to be most exposed to rem remaining contamination and risks at Hanford over the next 100, 200, 500, 10,000 years are our federal, federally recognized tribes. And um, this requires consideration of their unique exposures and perspective and uh, rights, which our board has struggled with, as well as the agencies have struggled with. And it was very good to see that the secretary spent time, as Esteban noted, with all three tribal nations. Um, I'm asking for an update on the idea that has been put forward that we begin our Hanford Advisory Board meetings with a land acknowledgement as we do with many other public agency meetings and especially when we are dealing with an acknowledgement uh, that the lands of concern and resources of concern are those of the nations that ceded them and retain rights to them under the treaties of 1855. So I'd like to have an update on whether or not you've had discussion about opening our board meetings with a land acknowledgement uh, in regard to the treaty rights as we do for many other public entities. And my second question is in terms of the risk reduction and costs and everything else, um, we seem to be rather stymied about whether or not we can even test, a two, go forward with just a 2000 gallon test of the test bed initiative as it's called to 
see if we can process and meet all standards for offsite disposal of 2,000 gallons, which is not a heck of a lot, um, uh, and meet all standards. And can you update us on, is this going to happen in the coming fiscal year? We heard that the money is there, so it's not a money issue. And can we get it going on this so that we can actually see if it works or not? And if it works, then we can proceed with full environmental and other reviews. So land acknowledgement update and test bed initiative update. Um, well, regarding the land acknowledgement, I think we, we already have a very, very robust tribal affairs program. We're working with the tribes at the staff level through the leadership level. And if that the Hanford Advisory Board wants to propose something from a land acknowledgement perspective that for consideration by the, the department and the, the, the state um, and EPA, we'd be happy to look at that. Um, so we'll just look forward to that recommendation formally through the process. Um, relative to TBI, we, we expect the technical evaluation report for, from the NRC to be delivered in the this summer. Um, our priority that we placed on limited resources with the NRC have, has been the 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 v law weir, which is certainly the the bigger player in the overall um, sequence of events relative to um, direct feed of heavy waste. Once we get the TER out of the NRC this summer, we'll evaluate that and we'll lay in a plan through the remainder of the project. Um, I would certainly like to execute the test bed initiative. Um, as as early as we feasibly can, I agree that the funds are now there for not only the installation, but the removal of the equipment, which is what the additional funds in FY22 were intended to do. So we'll 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 be able to update the board perhaps in the fall on the the overall schedule and timeline for test bed initiative. Is anyone is else? Anyone else? Yeah, Jerry, I as far as your first question about the land acknowledgement to begin meetings. Uh, I would have to check with um, Ryan on the communications to specifically answer your question whether there's been discussions about it or not within that particular group. Um, it is a it's one of those things we've talked about it here at Ecology at Nuclear Waste Program. Um, it's really critical that you do it right or you can actually be more offensive than helpful. Uh, so there's a lot that goes with um, those land acknowledgements and but I, I do hear you and um, if they're if it's something that um, that have members would like us to to pursue and, and look at more deeply, uh, we're open to that conversation. As far as TBI goes, um, my understanding is the weir process is underway. Uh, we have the TBI as a priority. Once we have a, an application sent our direction, we're in continuous communication with Department of Energy on that. Uh, and if we have to, I've already got commitment from the director. If we have to pull resources from another program, we will in order to process that application. Thank you both. Thank you both. Dave, anything? Yeah, get, and obviously we're we're not terribly involved in the test best bed initiative, but in terms of the land acknowledgement, yeah, if the HAB and particularly the, the our tribal representatives can can give us something to that would be meaningful and 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 appropriate. Um, I, you know, I want to do it right. I don't want to just do something that's that's pandering. That's not that that doesn't help anybody. And that's that's hurts and it's absolutely wrong. So I just I want to make sure that we get get the message right and and so forth. So. Thank you. We've got four folks on the phone. Um, Want to check in with them. Uh, star six gets you off of mute if you're on the phone, star six. Um, are there any questions from folks on the phone? Right. Yes. Yeah, this is Richard. Hey Richard, what's your question? Well, I, I got a couple of questions or comments. Um, Mr. Vance uh, mentioned, uh, you know, a, a diverse uh, board, but I, I'd like to to 
put a pitch in that term limits, much like in Congress, uh, is not always a good idea. I mean, I've been on the board for 10 years or more, maybe even 12, but you're not going to get people that are going to be willing to read 2,000 page documents readily. And some people will be committed to going through and trudging through the paperwork, but it gives a, a sense of um, what I would call um, at least comfort from gray beard board members. So I, I, while I'm probably going to be um, allowed to stay on the board, I think the board would be and DOE would be least served by reducing some of the people membership on the board solely because of term limits, especially if it's a six year term limit for life type of situation. That's my first point. My second point is uh, if you've noticed the price of gas has gone up, I'll put my Ben Franklin Transit board member hat on. We over, have over a hundred vans sitting idle. I really do ask that you from the top down to your contractors promote, I, I understand they're allowing carpooling, promote just reestablishing some of the vans. Uh, we did pull them over from uh, COVID. So we have hundreds of vans available and I'm trying to get a worker driver so we can get bus service out to the site. It will not violate your hand tax contract. And despite what members of DOE have been heard saying in private, it is the responsibility of DOE to ensure safe and efficient um, transit, to, uh, transport of the employees out to the site. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you. I've got one last person in queue before we go to break. Bob Suyama. Yes. Um, and my question is mainly for Brian. Um, I did hear your discussion about the uh changing of the board membership to to bring it up to speed the one of the advice points that we are going to discuss today and tomorrow is exactly about how that's going on um, the effectiveness of the hanford advisory board is mainly because we have long-term members who have experience and knowledge. And the uh, approach that DOE is taking to uh, change out the board is basically eliminating all that experience and knowledge. Uh, our advice point says, let's sit down, talk about what your goals are, and maybe we can come up with a acceptable process instead of just wiping out everybody after six years as Richard talked about. So I, I just like to get a little more background from uh, from Brian and maybe all the uh, TPA agencies on what do you think the role of the board is? Uh, for the last 28 years, we've been providing advice over 300 pieces and all of a sudden we're going to be uh, decimated, I guess is the word, uh, in the name of uh, term limits and diversity. So, Brian? Thanks, Bob. Um, you know, a couple things. One, I think decimated is should be replaced by revitalized. So we'll start with that. <laughs> um, you know, what I think is important to recognize is the role of the community boards is not technical, it's not oversight, it's not regulatory, it's not, you know, it doesn't have any role in inherently governmental activities like contracting. 
um, doesn't have access to budget information um, beyond what the, the members of the public are are available to see. Um, it's it's really an important board for working between the department and our community to understand um, to 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 enhance the understanding of our mission in an understandable and accessible way to as many people in our community as we can possibly achieve. I think the by by you know this approach by the administration to focus on a diversity and inclusion and move towards a board that is representative of our community today and our community of the future by those most affected by our cleanup will drive the department and um, ecology EPA and our contractors frankly to re-engage with the public in a way that allows us or, or requires us to explain our work explain our effort explain the risks um, with uh, with a perspective on education, knowledge, and ultimately to gain support. Um, the benefits are a few, right? We get number one, we get fresh perspectives that are forward looking. Um, we're able to um, understand the areas from the community where we have gaps in knowledge and understanding, because the board members will re reflect that back to us um, at, in a way that allows us in our responsibility to educate and engage to engage more constructively with our community. And it overall supports a healthier board environment because the members that have been on the board for long periods of time, um, becoming perceived as experts can limit the communications and engagement of those who are new to the board, who feel like they th their perspectives are not as valuable because they hear others who have been on the board for a long, long, long time talking about issues. Um, and it, it does help us move the board into a for, forward looking um, perspective that I think is absolutely critical. The members of the board who have served for a long period of time can continue to serve as members of the public, um, which all the meetings that we, we operate, I think you operate are, are available to them. But it, it does allow us to expand the number of people who are knowledgeable about our site, our mission, our progress in a way that I hope is constructive and helpful. And so there's a lot of benefits from turnover that are important. And I don't think it's a precondition to be have an effective board to have people that have been on the board for you know dozens of years at this point. Uh, I think a board can be very effective within the term limit structure because of that freshness and the perspectives that are so important for us to be able to work with our community to shape constructive outcomes going forward. So Dave or uh... Or Dave, <laughs> any other comments? Uh, especially the ecology side, because uh, I haven't heard a lot from the the other two tri-party groups on how you feel about changing out the board membership. Yeah, Bob. You know, I've I was saving that for the next for the next topic. To be perfectly <laughs> honest, um, you know. A couple of areas that I I personally have a concern in my leadership at headquarters is an agreement is that six years being a lifetime term limit doesn't make a whole lot of sense to us. Um, there's situations where you might have a college student who maybe is an intern somewhere, comes on the board, serves in an alternate position, uses up two or three years of, of, their, of their eligibility. Um, raises a family and then comes back and has a renewed interest in it or whatever it might be and then they only have two or three years left and it, it takes you know it took me I don't know 12 months or so to get up to speed on things and I still don't know everything I need to know um, you're at month 15 so I, I worry about that I um, I do want to make sure that we figure out some way to retain the historical knowledge in that type of thing if we're going to go down this path um, I, a lot of the concerns that I've seen, um, via different emails and expressed in these meetings, um, you know, we share, um, but at the, at the same time, we do support diverse representation and environmental interests. Um, we do acknowledge and need to educate and engage the next generation of HAB members. So we maintain an informed and active board. And, uh, one, I think one of the short term things we could do that I see coming down the path is, you know, June 30th, we have 17 expiring uh, terms and 
uh, and a quick easy fix for that is to extend those terms to September 30th uh, for that gap in membership. And uh, it just seems like something that should be able to administratively be done. But I'll go more in depth um, when we actually get into that topic later in the agenda. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So we have more interest um, from Lorraine, Jerry, and Mason. Steve, my recommendation is we 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 don't often get <coughs> Brian, Dave, and David all together all at once. And so if these questions are for um, our senior managers, I'm suggesting let's put off the break so we can have that conversation and then juggle a little bit when we get advice. Um, <coughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm OK with that. The one comment I'd make is um, I want to make sure that we hear from folks who have not had an opportunity to speak. I don't believe we've heard from Laureen or Mason yet. Um, okay, if Jerry would bear with us and let them go first. I'd appreciate that. Right. Absolutely. So Absolutely. Laureen, then Mason, then Jerry. Um, if it's if it's a, a comp. A comment on the advice. I'm going to invite you to to bump that to the advice conversation. But I do want to have a your opportunity to talk with with our senior managers here. Lorene. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Um, thanks for the opportunity to address um, you know the concerns surrounding the you know Hanford Advisory Board. I am currently in an appointment, and my term does expire in June. Um, and I just want to, you know, uh, take this opportunity to, I guess, um, uh, make the comment that, you know, I, I also am concerned about losing members that have that institutional knowledge and, you know, that can actually continue to provide, um, you know, some of the, the direction and leadership on the board. And I understand needing to change and move forward, but I think, you know, in the, the time of COVID, I have not been able to meet with, um, you know, the, the full Hanford Advisory Board members in person. Um, there's a difference, you know, when you're meeting in person versus, you know, when you we're virtual. And, you know, there's, I know that there's some, you know, um, I guess personal opinions about, you know, which is more effective or which is better. But, you know, it's always been my teaching that, you know, everyone present on a board should be allowed to speak. and and have you know input especially you know the when it affects the you know health safety and welfare of our communities you know at Hanford and so I'm you know I've had questions you know I will say that Yakima Nation was never approached about um, you know getting our opinion on this matter and you know so that's that's one of the things that I'm concerned about is that you know we didn't have any consultation on this and you know, just kind of hearing through, you know, the the rumor mill, so to speak, you know, the the concerns that are coming up and, you know, I'm sure that will be addressed in the next, you know, after the break, but I'm, you know, my concern is, you know, and the question, I guess, is, you know, who who is, you know, responsible for making these decisions? I, I understand the documents, I've read through them, you know, on how things should proceed and that there's been exemptions, you know, and, you know, ongoing for the fact, the mere fact that you do have people that have, you know, a long history on the board. And my personal opinion is I think you're doing it backwards. The new people should be, you know, coming in and, and having that opportunity to learn such as myself and, you know, being, um, you know, with some oversight for those that have been on the board for a long term. And, you know, we're, we're not getting any younger. So I personally would feel more comfortable you know, and and think that things would move along in a you know, uh, in a better I guess making better progress um, as far as you know situations that come up at Hamford and the decisions that are being made when we have you know those that have been here for a longer period of time you know to continue to you know move forward with you know those of us that are younger and and well you know actually new to the board not necessarily younger. But you know, have that opportunity to learn that historical knowledge from them. Um, you know, that's always been my teaching, and within my culture, is that it's you know, there's um, unwritten um, things that are are done, and that to me, this is like a normal process that I think should be followed. Um, so I, you know, my recommendation is you know, have the newer ones come in and, and participate and learn, 
and you know, but keep those you know, that have been here for a long time, um, you know, allow them to participate fully. And you know, again, my concern is, you know, myself, you know, we we were provided the conflict of interest form, and you know, and that kind of stirs up a little bit of you know concern because of the fact that you know the the main purpose that the accommodation sees in participation is to work in collaboration with everybody, you know, the the tribe parties and um, you know, moving forward, but when you're being questioned, like, you know, there's a potential conflict and your vote will be removed, you know, that's a little unsettling. And, you know, I think it's um, uh, disrespectful to those that have been on the board for a long time, you know, that they're being told, well, you know, you're going to be replaced because you know too much or, you know, we want new people in here. So I think that it should be reversed and, you know, new members of the board be given that opportunity to learn such as myself, you know, from those that have been here and fostered, you know, the progress that's been made. I think, you know, we should recognize those that have taken leadership roles, you know, in, on the board and, you know, um, allow them to participate fully and, you know, going forward. So um, that's my comment and question. Um, and I did want to know, you know, who, who, you know, instituted this or who started this whole process, because I've never really seen names other than, you know, the email I received and, you know, providing the application, you know, for the next term. So thank you. It, it's, so, I'll, so, just say, I'll just say it's an administration initiative um, that was thoroughly discussed with the college and EPA through the process, and we'll, we'll just leave it at that. Mason, your your question or comment? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I would just say CTUIR does have some serious concerns with this. I think that you know when we look at the best boards in industry. We don't see them stacking their boards with people that are unfamiliar with the subject matter or don't have long term experience um, or demonstrable experience, <clears throat> you know, and I think history repeats itself. And if and if that's any indicator, it's it's likely that um, some of these DOE interactions um, are have potential to also repeat themselves. And I think that uh, that's something that needs to be seriously looked at. <clears throat> um, but I think in general, my question is, is this DOE, is DOE using this as a purge tool to control the overall narrative um, and to remove any potential opposition? Uh, I think that's really kind of the main issue here is, you know, is this is this a tool to try and get rid of all of the um, knowledge and experience on this board in an attempt to to really control that narrative? It seems like it. Well, that's an inappropriate and unfortunate interpretation. I'll leave it at that. So Jerry, you get the last question or comment and then we'll take a break and move on to the, the membership advice, which is also this topic. Um, OK, Pam, is your question for the, the managers or is it on more on the advice? Help me help me with that. Um, I just want to share um, for the previous speaker that um, this came from DOE headquarters and it's being applied to all the boards across the country. So uh, don't focus your blame on uh, the Richland folks. It's uh, it's national. Thank you. Gary. Well, I want to appreciate that David B said he was staying for the next part of the conversation. Thank you. Um, uh, I am concerned that the definition of arbitrary and capricious applies to saying that we want to have term limits and all that wonderful flowery talk, Brian, that you just had about the benefits of it, but that you are only applying it, only applying term limits to public interest organizations essentially, and you have an arbitrary division and said majority or half the seats on the board are exempt from term limits. And I'd like to, having gone through and examined the makeup of the board, um, 
I want to know if you are at all concerned and have you raised with headquarters the reality that this arbitrary split where you apply term limits only to public interest groups essentially and the Hanford workforce representation and not to 15 of the currently filled 31 seats um, would have the effect of removing half of the women from this board because the most diverse seats when it comes to the underrepresentation of women in this field are not surprisingly filled in the seats that you are applying term limits to and the vast majority of women on the board are in the seats you're applying term limits to and your decision will have an immediate disparate effect of removing most of the women from this board. I find that very disturbing, likely illegal, certainly against the intent of the commitment by the administration to examine diversity of boards. And I'd like to know if you looked at that and have evaluated the impact of it and have received advice about the Title VI impact under the Civil Rights Act of a disparate impact of having applied term limits only to a small subset of seats, which are filled, 50% of which with women. And please don't tell me that this is insulting because I found your comment to be insulting before to um, representation representative of the C2IR who's asking a legitimate policy question about whether or not, given the fact you are applying this selectively, you've made a decision which seats to apply it to. Your logic should apply to everyone. So why isn't it applying to everyone? Gary, why don't we get an answer to your question? Well, uh, thanks, Jerry. I'm, I'm hopeful that the recruiting effort will resolve that issue. I didn't recognize that, and we'll certainly look at the legal ramifications, but I'm not a lawyer. I didn't stay at a Holiday Inn Express last night, so we'll we'll make sure we look at that within the broader context of trying to create um, the within the, the, the structure we've been given to operate by the department. We'll, we'll continue to work to achieve a board that is representative of our community um, and uh, make sure that it's representative across the multiple cross sections we're trying to achieve with this with this membership package. Thanks. So Steve, my recommendation is we've we've run long. Um, wanted to make sure that folks had an opportunity to ask questions of the TPA agencies. Um, we're going to continue this the discussion on membership package um, after a break. Um, I suggest we break till 10. 10 and come back and talk about advice. It's 10.53 right now. So we're going to break until 10.10? <laughs> <laughs> I'm old, but I ain't that old. <laughs> oh, man, I just stepped in it. Uh, is 11.10 more acceptable? Yeah, yes. I just want to thank the Brian and the other agency representatives for sticking around for this conversation. It's obviously one of importance to all of us. And um, as a member of the public, I am not exempt from term limits. So it's not just the special interest groups, but those of us who represent the public at large are also impacted. Uh, not that that's an issue to me, but just to let you know. Anyway, thank you all for a conversation of a sensitive subject and thank the agencies for bringing us up to speed on the tremendous progress that has been made and is being made. Um, again, as an old timer, I'm really thrilled at where we're at today and I'm optimistic that we can figure out ways to work together toward tomorrow. So enjoy your short break. Please join us at 1110 Pacific time. Bob, we'll have to get you off of mute. Okay, I think I'm there.
Can you hear me? Yes, we can. I think your uh, <laughs> clock on the wall must be non-daylight savings time. <laughs> no, I didn't have enough tea this morning. <laughs> I, thought we were gonna, I thought we weren't going to do daylight savings anymore. <laughs> we had to change standard time. I was on the phone at 6.15 this morning, and the, the, the hot tea didn't show up until a couple hours later because I got distracted. Ruth, I'd still like to start with your chart if we can. Oh, you want to start with the chart? Yeah, just to make sure everybody knows that we're following that arrow in some particular direction. That's under. Wouldn't believe how many, how many tabs I have open right now. Not sure what time zone I am in, but I know where the chart is. Steve, uh, this is Dan Strom. I sent you an email on how you can get into the chat. Oh, um, okay. yeah. So and you have to be logged in to Microsoft Teams with the same email that Ruth and Josh send on the invitation in order not to be a guest or, or in order to get to the chat. So right. some. Some guests who were invited with that email, like Annette Carey, can see it because she's logged in with the email that was used, even though she's not a member. But if you're, you know, I, I, so I've had this problem before, and, and I, I sent you the solution. Thank you. When I get an opportunity, I'll try to implement it. I am, I need uh, what we, my wife and I call youths. We need somebody under 40 to help us. <laughs> okay, well, Everybody Josh needs a teenager. <laughs> Josh and I spent some time with the Street Legal Tech and um, Tom Galliotto because he was having a similar problem. So uh, between Dan's email and what Josh and I learned with Tom, um, we can we can get you out of that dilemma. Yeah, I'm, Just, I'm hopeful that it won't be a problem too much longer. <clears throat> now we can we can fix that. Um, real meetings. <laughs> real meetings. Right, hybrid meetings. Um, so let's let's uh, gather up here. Um, Steve, do you want to say a, a word and a half about consensus while I show this graphic? Yes, please. I know we've got a lot of new members and a lot of new listeners, and goodness knows I haven't met half. Of them. I haven't seen you in person in a long time. So what we want to talk about here is we've got three pieces of advice that uh, are in need of conversation and determination of consensus. And I just wanted to point out that these pieces of advice were prepared by issue manager groups and committees and are now being presented to the full board for the full board's consideration. And the more participation we have, the more informed we will be by the time we decide on consensus or not consensus. We can modify these um, draft advices during the <clears throat> content of the meeting, or we can send them back to committee for more work. But the main thing I wanted to point out is consensus is not defined as 100% agreement. And as an old engineer, I don't come from a consensus environment, so I have to keep training myself what it might mean to me. And what it means to me now is that as the board chair, I'm required to sign our consensus advice. And I just like to acknowledge to myself that I don't have to agree with every word in that advice. I just have to agree with the concept of it enough to agree that I would consent to send it forward. And as members, uh, the people who are proponents of the advice, uh, I would like to ask your assistance in seeking input from the members who are quiet. We have a challenge on this board that we have some very informed and aggressive leaders that sometimes might in, inadvertently intimidate folks into being quiet if they disagree. 
So if you have an opinion, please feel free to share it. And if you're the proponent of the advice, please seek that comment from folks who may have a different view or a modifying view. I don't know if that helped or hurt, but it helped me. <laughs> so with that, we can proceed. So the, the translation of the graphic, um, briefly, informed consent, this is this is actually taken out of the facilitation course I wrote. An informed consent is, is a different term for consensus out of the Hans Bleicher work on public participation and public involvement. Um, the point being, that consensus is basically everything to the right of total opposition, which is everything from, I guess I can live with it, to this is better than chocolate. <laughs> um, and you may find that, that you privately live somewhere on that spectrum. Consensus is not actually unanimous agreement in every single word on the page. With that, <clears throat> We're going to jump to Bob Suyama in PowerPoint. So you all send me documents in all different formats. It's really kind of fun. <laughs> um, so Ruth, can I share my screen just for a second? Do you want to share your screen? Yeah, just for a yeah, second. Yeah, Is I can't see what's up. Is it uh, my, there is, there's my reset button? Yet. Yeah, it's your reset button. Oh, OK. So that was just to get it started here. Uh, well, how do I get back? That's um, I, can, nice I can take it away picture. from you. OK, get me back. <laughs> I can take it away from you. OK, thank you. <laughs> <clears throat> so this advice is on the uh, Board membership changes. In our last meeting in January, uh, the US DOE, and as you heard Brian say, this is a headquarters initiative, uh, basically told us that they were going to restructure the membership of the Hanford Advisory Board. And they were going to apply six year term limits. Uh, and they were going to attempt to impose diversity requirements on the board's membership. Um, since then, uh, Gary Younger has visited every committee that had meetings in February and also the EIC and, and attempted to uh, discuss this with the membership and clarify. So uh, I think most people know what the, the actions are that are going on. So next slide, please. So our advice, if you read it, uh, has several pages of background information, talks about the have, how we got where we are. But I want to talk about what is the advice <laughs> that we're actually going to put forward. And the advice is pretty simple. Uh, it says, suspend some of the actions you're doing now uh, that have informed members that if they don't uh, change and come up with new membership, they could, their organization could be eliminated from the board. Um, and the EMSSAB charter does allow term limit extensions. And so those are just background kind of things you should do right away to give us some time. The real advice is the third advice point. And what we're asking for is for the TPA agencies to sit down with the board and come up with a written plan that looks at what the goals are. What are the things that DOE headquarters is asking us to do? What are we attempting to accomplish? And then as a group, write down 
how we might achieve these goals and brainstorm some ideas and then actually come up with a path forward that we all support. Because right now it is DOE dictating to us what they're doing. There, there is no written plan. Uh, it, it's, it, I think we had a discussion where um, Carrie Myers said, hey, we can give you term limit exceptions. But it, it really was not laid out on what the criteria is for term limit exceptions or waivers. And it, uh, Gary Younger has laid out diversity goals, and these aren't written down either. And so there, there is a, an approach here where all of this advice is asking for is to talk it over, discuss it with the TP agencies and the board to come up with a plan that we can all live with instead of just dictating how we're going to do things. So that is basically what the advice says now. And uh, we're going to probably step through every paragraph of the advice to see what the background <coughs> says. But remember what we're trying to accomplish at the end and give us more input. So Ruth, can you take us through the actual advice? While I am madly trying to <coughs> change documents. Um, for those who are uh, relatively new or very new to the board advice process, um, what we normally do is introduce advice on the first day of a board meeting. And the, the real decision that needs to be made today is a go, no go decision. Go, no go means it is close enough to what we're agreeing on to go to the second day of the board meeting where it would be formally adopted. Yes, there is often wordsmithing involved between those two things. But the question that I will ask you before lunch is, do you want this to come before you tomorrow for formal adoption? <clears throat> Even if the words aren't exactly what you want as of today. Because we're a little time squished, I will interrupt us at 1145 because we have public comment scheduled in the agenda and I want to make sure we honor that for anybody who wants to make public comment. So <clears throat> there's going to be an interruption, but we're going to take this um, till noon. I think we can cut into lunch a little bit. Um, so it's, it's a little constrained today. The decision is go, no go. That's today's decision on this advice. Again, use chat if you've got want to say. So if we could just go by paragraph by paragraph and have everybody read through and uh, give us any comments on changes you might want. Uh, this advice came forward from the EIC. Uh, we had a very, very robust discussion. Is that the word I want? <coughs> and there was actually another version of the advice that came forward, but there wasn't time to go word by word through that one. So this is the one that the uh, IM team put forward. So Ruth, take us through it, please. So I'm going to propose that we go a little bit backwards. OK. Um, <clears throat> and get agreement on the three advice points. Um, because I don't want you to get in a rabbit hole wordsmithing background without agreement on the actual advice. Um, and then go back to the background to uh, revise or improve it um, <clears throat> in response to group discussion. So let's start with the three paragraphs that are the actual advice. Steve Wigman, I didn't even get there in your hands up. What's up? Yeah, yes, thank you. Turn my camera back on. Um, maybe I'm taking this out of order a little bit, but um, the third bullet 
asks for full participation and concurrence. Um, and I'm thinking of, we really want collaboration, but can we pursue something like consensus instead of concurrence? Because it sort of implies that everybody has to be in full agreement with what it says. And it's just a, a nit, maybe. <clears throat> Trying to okay. find way to turn the switch on and off. <clears throat> so the proposal would be to. Take out. <clears throat> so let's go back up to the first bullet. Pam, first bullet. OK, well, I just want to remind everyone who um, is a particularly new members who are really irritated about all this. It did not come from Panther. It came from DOE headquarters and it's being applied to every advisory board in the country. So um, in the first bullet, I suggest in the second sentence, as an independent board, the HAB should be included in discussions. It is their board. It is their opportunity to define what they need. And we have a new administration that has imposed its requirements on the Department of Energy. So um, that's where it's coming from. And I think uh, should is a better word. Thank you. <coughs> OK. Other comments on bullet number one? Uh, in the independent board, uh, that is described in the in the background. So that will be uh, discussed a little more when we look at the background. Susan, and then Steve again. Susan I agree. Thank you. I agree with the changes that have been made. I uh, and I absolutely believe this should go forward. And I think independent is absolutely an appropriate word <laughs> as it was discussed by John Wagner at the board's first meeting and continue to be that um, DOE will pay with taxpayer dollars to all of those people they want to be cheerleaders. And most of these folks on this board do it because they care about the environment and the, and, and the people who work out there. And so I, I think independent speaks to the board's ability to work through consensus and work collaboratively with the agencies in the past um, and have the ability to obtain the information that is needed to build informed advice um, that is actionable if DOE uh, expects to take action as well as the other agencies. Um, and the independent part is really important. So I, I do like the changes and I think Pam's um, uh, and concurrence consensus as well as the should is are absolutely right because we are not an oversight board but um so we can't say they must do this or must do that because it isn't determined by law so uh, i agree with that thank you <clears throat> all right i've got steve wigman and then a question from mason steve uh, two comments in the first bullet I would suggest eliminating the word immediately. It gets the same result. And then in the third bullet, I would replace full participation with collaboration. Mason, I, I saw your question or your comment in chat because we've got four people on the phone and not everybody can see the chat. I'm going to invite you to to speak that as well. 
Yeah, no problem. Yeah, Mesa Murphy, CTYR alternate. Um, I just want to clarify that my previous comment uh, and question to um, to Mr. Vance and others was was not directed to the Hanford DOE EM, but uh, DOE across the board. I know that this isn't. I know at our Stigwig in 2019, uh, several tribes had mentioned issues with DOE that have been long-standing issues, and as I mentioned, history seems to be repeating itself in those. Uh, in those pieces. So I think really the main question for me is, does this apply only to DOE related boards? Because it seems to be the case. Okay. Could I respond to that? Yeah, I was, that's the I was looking at FACA the other day, and one of the things that I believe I read was that the agencies can impose term limits. It didn't it wasn't mute on it, but it did give the agencies the opportunity to impose term limits. And the way DOE is doing it in this case feels um, inconsistent in the way different groups are treated. And I think that's one of the issues that we're trying to collaborate on. Um, but I also looked at the history of term limits and term limits in our society were created to minimize what was called power monopoly. And we have an issue with our board because we have a power monopoly in the sense that our senior members are the primary speakers and the primary workers and the, the quiet majority seems to be a little left out. So whatever we do going forward, we need to think about how do we get past that image of a power monopoly or a podium. That's not something for the advice, it's just something for folks to think about. And I would hope when we sit down uh, and discuss this under advice point three, that we come up with a plan that really does address that. Uh, also, uh, on FACA, EM SSABs uh, is where they added the six-year term limit. That is a decision they made when they put the EM SSABs together. So for, for new folks who, who may be lost in alphabet soup, the EMSSAB, the Environmental Management Site-Specific Advisory Board, is the national advisory board that advises DOE on cleanup. And it's got eight subcommittees, of which the HAB is one. So there are also boards in Oak Ridge and Northern New Mexico and Paducah and Portsmouth and Savannah River and Idaho and Nevada and they all are called boards, but technically they're subcommittees of this national body. And there is a charter under the Federal Advisory Committee Act, you'll hear FACA, that charter for the EMSSAB and its subcommittees actually contains a provision for term limits. So hopefully that makes the alphabet soup a little bit more understandable. <clears throat> Shall we look at advice point number two? Are there any questions, uh, suggested revisions? The, the EMSSAB FACA charter contains a provision that people may request term limit exceptions. So it's got a term limit and it also has a provision for a, a process to request an exception to a term limit. Yeah, on bullet number two, um, for the those who are represent the public at large, um, nominating authorities maybe doesn't have any meaning hmm. because the public at large can nominate themselves. So I just want to point that out that nominating authorities may not be relevant to quite a number of seats on the board for the public at large. 
I think the uh, process manual or in the MOU actually says the nominary authority for the public at large is DOE ecology or the TPA agencies uh, in addition to the Hanford workforce, I think, are also in that same group. Right. So the, the, the process thing here, I can't believe I'm talking so much. The process thing here, every seat on the board has a nominating authority for certain seats like public at large, non-union, non-management employees. The nominating authority happens to be the tri-party agency. So every seat does, in fact, have a nominating authority for this board. I, Mason, should bases in bullet two be base is? Okay. What your... Oh. <laughs> I'm trying to. Okay. <laughs> okay, good. Because I'm not finding it, but you guys, you guys will straighten me out. I know that. Um, it, that's bullet three. Yeah. Oh, is it bullet three? That's why I couldn't find it. Got it. Okay. Um, we also have a tech editor who checks stuff like that before we actually sign things, just in case. Are there any other comments, questions? Wording changes on the three advice points. Tom Galliotto. Yes, ma'am. Um, this has a long uh, history uh, uh, for the development of this advice and approval of it through the IM team and the EIC. And this has been discussed before, but was put on hold until this public meeting with a full half. So, um, as representing TRIDEC, I've been asked to add a fourth bullet here. It's not brand new. It's, it has been discussed um, with members of the IM team as well as with the EIC, but it was not included in this version because Bob uh, has indicated that the EIC uh, decided to only send the version for review at this meeting. Uh, that was approved officially by the IM team. So in any case, we suggest adding a, a modified version of what was discussed in the EIC meeting uh, for the fourth bullet. And I'll, I'll read the words to you, Ruth, if you could type them in and we can go over them. Uh, the board advises that the DOE Hanford field offices engage in discussions with the board and with other TPA agencies to ensure that the mission of the board is clearly understood by all going forward, Go, comma, and that the board's activities enable active participation by impacted communities, period. That is a modification from what we discussed before, talking about the uh, local communities focus that's gone from this. And we propose that that advice item should be added as well. Okay, I've got Jan and Liz in queue. Can you have Richard, please? Okay, Jan, Liz, Richard on the phone, and Jerry. I hope that's close to how fast the hands went up. <laughs> um, Dan, you're up. Thank you. So, um, 
I have to say that I, although I participated in editing the document, that this was not part of the conversation that I, you know, was party to or listened to. What I would like Tom to explain is what, how the advice point um, changes what we are already asking DOE to do or the tri-party agreements to do. It seems like it may be a reiteration of something that's in advice point one having to do with asking DOE to uh, not make unilateral decisions and to engage with the board. Uh, yes, Jan, I think the focus in the additional item was um, uh, the mission of the board. And we heard that discussion at some depth earlier today from Brian and others on we're at a crossroads, DOE's at a crossroads, DOE expects some, the Hanford Advisory Board to to modify its approach and and fit more within the, if you will, the new new age version of where we're headed. Um, this bullet is focused, and it's it, I think it's appropriate with this advice item too, because the, the term limit extension is dramatically affecting what we thought the board mission was in the past and still is, as far as I'm concerned. And so the the key to that fourth item is uh, defining the mission to, so it's clearly understood now and how in essence how this term limit uh, action will will support that new mission. Do you think that um, the background continues to support this fourth bullet? I think it does. Right. I've got more people in queue. Just remember, in five minutes, I'm going to interrupt us for public comment. So it's not personal. I just want to make sure that we we honor that time slot. Liz, and then Richard on the phone. Yeah. Um. Thanks. It doesn't seem as written that this really adds anything to the advice. Um. And and maybe I understand a little bit more about what you're saying with the mission, Tom. After you explain that. Um, the way Brian Vance explained the mission this morning, I was not really a fan with that <laughs> explanation. I don't, that's not how I understand the board, um, the board's role. Um, and I think these changes also like kind of applied unilaterally by DOE is problematic. And this seems to say that we want DOE to be, it's, it's just interesting. It seems like we want them to be defining the mission of the board, not the board being a co-collaborator in cleanup. Um, so I don't know, it just it doesn't seem like that adds anything. And it also seems like it's elevating, lo like it's kind of potentially reigniting the regional versus local community, like who's more important in the conversation in a way that seems like, and I don't know if that's your intent, but it, it seems like it, it has a little bit of that in there. So maybe you can explain that. Sure. Um, <clears throat> regarding the last point first that you made, there was no intention. In fact, that's what's been hopefully edited out of this version uh, that you're seeing in front of you. There's no intention to focus on uh, the regional needs versus the local needs and how one is more or less impacted by by uh, Hanford activities than the other. That, that's not intended here. It was taken out of here. And basically it just refers to impacted communities as a whole. And that, that's, that's really what the change, the primary change was from what the EIC discussed uh, several weeks ago. As far as fitting in, uh, this in no way is intended to support the fact that the HAB should change its mission. The, the the em, em, emphasis here is to make sure we understand and define that mission so that both the TPAs and the Hampshire Advisory Board can agree to what that mission is to be. It's, a, it's an important point because it all ties into the diversity issue and the elimination of 
of uh, experience from the board by imposing term limits. Yeah, I think maybe with a few changes and, I, and maybe other people have a suggestion. I, I like that concept. Um, but I think maybe some words, switching some words around might help make that. More sure. Clear. Thanks. Yeah, we'll, we'll be open to that. Thank you. <clears throat> Richard, you're on the phone. What are you thinking? OK, am I up? Yes, you are. This is Richard. OK, Richard, um, I just I disagree with putting advice point four in uh, because I don't think it's advice, but I would suggest we just move it up as a discussion point in the background. And I don't hear a comment come back. Um, also, the other thing, I, I don't have the advice in front of me because uh, I'm, I'm driving. Um, but one thing that came up that we should look at where we should appropriately put in the word lifetime term limit. Um, you know, we, we should emphasize the, the absurdity of lifetime because historically, in there is in the DOE uh, uh, documentation under the FACA website. Historically, it said uh, term limits, but it was not a lifetime term limit, and it was it was written as three consecutive terms of two years. Um, and so, uh, I you know we heard this morning about the question of lifetime being applied. Um, we all hopefully live a long life and we might want to come back to the board sometime. So <laughs> that's my suggestion. Okay. Uh, Richard, to respond to your first question and putting it into the background, I think we all, all that have been on the board for uh, some short number of years, realizes that the background is only explanatory and has no impact or is not addressed uh, in any response we get from DOE. So I, I, I but, not, but again, I, I don't I don't see it as an actionable item. I mean, I don't see it as a useful at this point. The topic it's off topic. I mean, if if we want to do a separate one, that's fine. The topic is the the this basically term limits of the board that had nothing to do with the board and making an offer to have that discussion in the background i think is fine that's not yeah it's not addressable but it it is read by by you know basically to to bring it up but i don't see it as an actionable item okay. richard i've got a question for you and then we've got to go to public comment is the inclusion of a proposed fourth bullet about the board mission a deal breaker for you in supporting the advice yes i've got to interrupt us and check i uh 11 45 we have slotted for public comment um i have not received any let me double check um any requests to make public comment Double checking, triple checking. Um, however, if there is anyone on the phone or if there's anybody logged into Teams um, via chat um, that would wishes to make public comment, we would love to hear your thoughts now. Um, just let us know, because right now I don't have anybody on the list. Anybody who would like to make public comment? If you change your mind, there is time for public comment tomorrow as well. Um, let anybody on the facilitation team know, and we would be happy to make that happen for you. All right, <clears throat> back to what we were working on. Um, so, um, where are we? 
So for Richard, the inclusion of, of point number four um, would preclude his consensus on the advice. Did I hear that right, Richard? That's correct. I just see it as diluting the, the advice point overall. Um, next, I, I have Jerry, Chris, Dan Solitz, and Rob in the queue, just so you know we've got a queue. Jerry, you're up. Let's get you off of mute. There we go. I, yeah. um, uh, I had proposed language similar to this, and um, it was discussed, but it was not. Um, uh, there it, it wasn't enough time to vet it through the executive committee. The IM team did look at this. And I have gone through and I've provided a new link in chat to the analysis of how term limits would immediately reduce more than by 50% representation of women on the board. Um, this is shocking to me and we heard that DOE, despite the fact that this was raised as early as December, has never considered this impact. Um, it is not just the representation of women on the board, but it is effective participation by women on the board. That when you selectively apply term limits and you are applying it to eliminate the women who have had a longstanding experience and institutional memory, it has tremendous impact on the ability to recruit and have the perspective of women. It, we often forget that we are talking about women in an underrepresented field here. Not just engineering and cleanup, but this is nuclear weapons production and its legacy. And there weren't many women managers and the research for example, on health effects was done only on men and to this date, radiation health effects uh, standards are set based on male exposures and response. Yet we know that women are approximately nine times more sensitive to certain types of ionizing radiation than men are. But we set standards and we say what's safe based on men. That's just one of a thousand examples of why it's important to have women representation and have women with experience participate in the board. And I believe that it is vital that we add this bullet uh, that you've typed out here, that there should be part a dialogue about the effect of selective application of term limits on women's representation on the board and then the longer term impact of term limits on diversity because if you apply the term limits only to the seats that are also being used to diversify the board there is you basically are saying Welcome, come on in. As soon as you've got a great deal of experience, we're recycling you out and your representation of your communities is not going to be as effective as those people who have been on the board for over six years who have developed greater links to their community. So that's important for us, I think, to put in here and for this to include short and long term effects on diversity from uh, how USD has proposed this. All right. I've got Chris, Dan, and Rob in queue. Uh, Chris, you're up. Yes, this is Chris. Um, I think the bullet that, that, that Tom put up is is really critical, especially the first part of it, 
I was quite surprised to hear Tom Vance's version or Brian Vance's version today about what he felt that the role of the HAB ought to be going forward from this point on, because it's really quite substantially different than the slide that that uh, the deputy designated federal officer puts up at the start of his his discussion to kick off our board meetings, which is our role is to provide policy level advice and recommendation concerning various aspects of cleanup. What Tom said is, is, is very different than that, although, although it could include it. So I think the idea of understanding what our mission is going forward is really critical. And I think that bullet ought to be definitely included somewhere in this advice. Maybe it could be rolled into number one, because I, I do agree that it's not specifically an, an advice point, but I think it is critical. The other comment I want to make, um, and I'm not sure, it, maybe it could appear in the background somewhere, is that going forward, when DF law finally reaches full operational status, for the next 50 years, this site is going to be doing the same thing day in and day out, along with the routine groundwater monitoring program. So let's say in funding terms, about 75% of the site is going to be doing the same thing day in and day out for 50 years. If you have term limits, there's quite a good possibility that over three terms, six years, a board member may not there may not really be opportunity to, to say something substantial um, to, to have any real impact because it's going to be same old, same old, same old for 50 years. So I think the whole concept of term limits going forward, given that the site is going into an operational viewpoint, of uh, operational stance that's going, to, that's going to last for 40 or 50 years, I think that needs to be taken into account somewhere when we talk about a small number of term limits. Those are my comments. Dan Solitz. Good morning all. My uh, first comment is directed for uh, the, the fourth point there in affected communities. If that could be clarified a little bit, I would suggest uh, the uh, Columbia River watershed, because going east and north, that takes care of the airshed, and going uh, west, that takes care of the uh, the water. So that it, there would be a little bit to, to ensure that it's a broad, broadly interpreted as interpreted as as far as affected communities go. Um, my second comment relates to what Brian said about the role of the board. I don't think that he left as a role except as cheerleader. So um, I think we really need to improve his view of that. Thank you. Right. Do you have specific wording you want to suggest adding, Dan? Yes, instead of affected communities, I would suggest the uh, Columbia River watershed. Uh, yes, thank you. Rob, thank you for waiting. No, thank you. Um, I think that we all need to remember that, uh, and, and Pam's point is true, is that these are being um, sent down, these rules are being sent to us by Washington, D.C. That I don't feel this letters or this advice, any of the advice points will be accepted. Um, I think that they'll just move on and continue to do what they're going to do. Um, so, uh, so I'm kind of upset and disappointed because if our true mission is to give policy level advice on cleanup and Amford activities, um, I don't see how we can do it within the framework they're giving us at this point. Um, I 
have a great fear for the life of the Hanford Advisory Board and uh, in our future. So um, I, I totally support the advice going forward, but we're starting to get repeating ourselves over and over again. Engage us, talk to us, be transparent. And, and we're not really getting that. So uh, that's my two cents worth, and thanks for listening. <clears throat> So um, for those who, who may not remember when we actually did meet in person, um, often when we, we would get to, to this point, and, and admittedly, we have not gone through the background yet. We've only been working on the advice point. Um, the board would identify a handful of folks who would gather in the back of the room at the end of the HAB meeting on the first day and work with language and edits and revisions. So we'd huddle around a laptop and we'd do that and you would see a revised draft advice on the second day, usually sent out that evening um, by email. Um, let me propose that we go till 12.15, that we, we cut a little bit into lunch. Um, I still actually need a little bit more than an hour for lunch to, to do some stuff so that the rest of the meeting will work. Um, briefly go through the background and then identify some folks who can stick around on this meeting and I will work with them to work with language to bring you something for, um, well, we'd send it out tonight and you'd see it in the morning. Um, because I don't want you to spend all of lunch wordsmithing. Um, I've got three people in queue. Let's take them first and see how far we get. Uh, Bob, Liz, and Esteban. Bob? Okay, when I look at the last three advice points, uh, the one that starts with, we like DOE to engage with us, uh, that is also the next one and the next one. Uh, they're all asking for a dialogue. So would it be permissible when we sit down and try to rewrite this that we have one bullet that says, talk to us, basically. And these are some of the topics that you need to talk to us about, which is what we're trying to accomplish with this restructuring of the board. Uh, don't forget about what the board's mission is and Jerry's points about how they're going about selectively doing term limits. So we could combine all of those into one that says, talk to us. Is that permissible? Is that acceptable? Bob, from my standpoint, this is Tom. I, I, I think that works. It would be a little cleaner. Okay. Jerry's got his hand up. Okay, hang on a second. Um, can't think fast enough. Jan has a concern about the impacted communities being defined as, as the watershed, and I wanted to, to capture that. Okay. Okay. I have Liz, Esteban, and Jerry. Liz? <clears throat> Thanks, Ruth. Um, I just had some potential language that I don't know if it will work for the, the mission piece. Um, I put it in the chat, um, and it needs some tweaks, but more putting it more of us saying our role is to provide input that actually impacts cleanup. Um, and we really want DOE to embrace or re-embrace that, that role and purpose, not just instead of just saying it's like, we should do this collaboratively. It feels like we're, we've left, there's this, there's this uh, indication that, that that role of the board is being left behind and it's more like a body to be. I, uh, you know what I mean? Where, where did you want that language? I struggle with language that gets thrown in chat because. Yeah, I was just it, saying as a, it's, as a 
an alternative to what Tom Galliotto proposed about the discussions. So it would replace the, um, I didn't include like the active participation by impacted communities piece so that there might need to be a sentence about that, but it would replace the board advises that the DOE Hanford field offices engage down to the comma after forward. Okay. Um, can you, if I cut and paste out of chat, it, it literally doesn't cut and paste yep. because of a quirky thing. Um, do you want me to read it out? It, actually, what I want you to do is email it to Bob and me because okay. that's going to fall into wordsmithing later today. Um, okay. so I've yeah. made a note um, that, that there's that. Um, we're, we're, we still haven't gotten to the no go no decision. So I, I want to hear what people have to say and get to that decision before we immerse ourselves in the perfect and the good. Um, Esteban. Ruth, can I jump in real quick? Um, Ruth, can I jump in real quick? I just okay. want to make and, one quick statement. Yeah, go ahead, Richard. Okay. Okay. The charter for all the ES and AB boards is one charter. And I'm not quite sure we have a, a, a true mission statement to discuss. So if we want, rather than, and that's why I'm, I, I objected to the discussion of mission per se, you know, maybe the discussion could be of our charter and applicability of the ESAB charter. Okay, I'm going to add that comment. Note to self. Um, Esteban, thank you for waiting. Hey, You're no, up. no problem. Thank you, Ruth. And yeah, and thanks, Rob, for that summer because one of the things I think as a person coming from DC and here and doing <clears throat> this work, one of the things that people in DC say is that people outside of DC don't understand policy. And I think like Susan just pointed out in the chat that about talk and that Bob said talk yeah, how does that implementation of what's happening and what's happening at Hanford and the suggestions by the board and the community are actually being implemented? And then I think finally, the big thing is that, that I think um, the self-recognition, I think about what the person from the DOE said about evolving and to the community process. And I think that, you know, getting our political leadership involved but that actually takes more work, you know, and being conscious of that work to happen, to make it happen, because at the end, I think in that wording is that exactly like I think that's the purpose of the board, right? What is the community saying and how are you going to implement the work and are you actually going to do it? It's uh, if that's going to happen. I think that to me, I think that's the reason. And, and value all the work that's been going on by the board and everybody else that I think they don't want to see that that doesn't happen, right? Because all the work that has been happening already. Right, I've got a lot in the chat. That's what I've got. Um, Gary, you're up. We'll get you off of mute. So Thank you. Good. There we are. Um, uh, uh, first off, um, you know, in, in regard to the point in chat that Susan Lackban has raised, talk to us. We'll, they'll, we, oh, we've talked. You know, this was this was your conversation. Um, I think that we should uh, uh, revise the lead in to say that we are requesting a dialogue with. Um, a facilitated dialogue 
with USDOE headquarters as well as local. And that that we should be discussing, I think, a facilitation that includes environmental justice and part uh, some you know experience with public participation and boards. Um, a little bit of history for people. Again, history is important. The reason there is one EMSSAB charter is pretty darn simple. 20 years ago, presidential administration issued a order to reduce the number of advisory boards across all federal agencies. To make it workable, they said, oh, all the EM site advisory boards are just one board. However, each of you keep your individual charters and purposes. Um, so that's the background. So I, I'm suggesting that we say a facilitated dialogue with and includes headquarters. I want to point out that uh, I don't, uh, you know, maybe people are being told different things. I've been told pretty clearly that USDOE headquarters has said to the site, you have considerable discretion here. And that that discretion is pretty darn evident in the fact that this site is being told it can apply term limits to only some seats and not to others not to all seats. So I think it is important that we include DOE headquarters and their uh, public uh, dialogue, uh, I'm forgetting the, the term title, but that the person at headquarters who is responsible for both um, participation and um, effective participation by communities and interests in EM uh, needs to be part of this discussion. It is clear that both this, this a site and headquarters decision rather than just the headquarters decision. Um, but the main point of this being um, uh, that the lead in be for advising about a dialogue that be a facilitated dialogue. Number one, number two, mm -hmm. uh, it include expertise and broader participation of both entities. Um, I'm available this evening. I'm chairing a committee from at one o'clock legislative hearing, so I can't do this over lunch, but I'd be available to work on it this evening. Thank you, Jerry. So I'm I'm watching the time and, and knowing what has to happen over lunch to make the rest of the meeting work. Um, and I've got three people in queue, which we won't be able to knock out in four minutes. Bob, my recommendation is that we identify folks who are willing to work right after the meeting adjourns. So think 415 so people can go get coffee or whatever um, and work on language if, big if, the larger group believes this needs to come back to the board in the morning. So this is the go, no go decision. Um, and, and I need to apologize to Susan, Steve, and Pam um, about the timing. Bob, what do you think? OK, let's take a heads up. Uh, finger, thumb up, thumb down, and then get the volunteers if we get a thumbs up. Um, actually, let's do it. Let's do it the other way. Is there anybody who is opposed to bringing this back to the full board in the morning? Um, let us know in the chat. That's probably the easiest way. Richard, you're on the phone. Let me check with you. Are you okay with this coming back in the morning? Yeah, and, and, and the approach of one meeting, one discussion, and multiple bullets under it, I have no problem with. Okay. Thank you. Um, Emmett, do you have a question about process? Because I got three people in queue, and I don't want to offend my people in queue. Okay. Right, right now I feel left out because 
And we talk about diversity. You've got a basically a whiteboard, but we never talk about ethnic diversity. And that really bugs me. You know, Gary talked about women, but we need to talk, if we're talking about community involvement, we're talking about uh, different segments of the community, it's not represented in here. That's my comment. I am not visibly seeing anything in chat that says, no, don't bring this back tomorrow. Um, this is Susan. Can I add something here? I yeah. think perhaps we can help Emmett, and I agree with him, that we could say in the background that board members encourage diversity, including ethnic uh uh, you know, I think we can add something like that to the background just to say that part of what DOE wants to accomplish that they're telling us is appropriate. It makes sense that, that we should encourage that, that we encourage and our, our, our hope that we will reach more ethnic uh, diversity, uh, you know, something along those lines. Uh, you know, I can understand Emmett's concern and that makes sense. What do you all think? And it can be a bullet and put a bullet in there. I think we could even add it to the third, the one that we asked them to talk to us. Uh, right. We could we could add as one of those goals. Right, as, absolutely. Yeah. Sure. Right. Um, okay. Uh, Steve okay. and Pam, how fast can you be before we ask for volunteers to help tonight? Steve? I think you're on a good path. Go forward. Okay, that's fast. Very fast. Oh, geez. We're taking care of my mom, and she's had a stroke. I, I just want to be sure that um, the reference to um, the Columbia River watershed is going to background. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay, note to self. Who wants to work on wording at 4.15? I've got Liz, I've got Jerry, Bob, I think you get roped in because you get roped in. Okay, so, um, we have an after party for the tank advice. Oh, I needed that. Thank you. <laughs> okay. I'm just going to leave this line open after the board meeting is over. We are not going to record the word tonight. Okay. Um, and Lorene is willing as well. So we will take a little break after we adjourn the board meeting and come back about 4.15 um, and have, have a word smithing party. Thank you so much for sticking with it. Um, if you've got suggestions on wording or concepts that come to you, email them to Bob Suyama and me, and we will make sure it, it gets factored in. Um, because doing chat when we're doing Q, it's unfortunately, I sometimes miss stuff and I'm been very does happen. Um, and I don't want to leave out your idea. So, Steve, with that, I'm going to say let's do lunch until 1.30. And we will work on draft advice on cleanup priorities. Sounds good. Thank you all. all right. Thank you for your work this morning. up priorities. Oh, tiny print. Let's see if we can't find it. Okay, Ruth, are we are we set to go? Yeah, I think we're we're good. Steve, are you with us, Mr. Chair?
Doesn't look like Steve is with us, but Shelly is with us, so go for it. Very good. We do have a quorum, right? Um, I haven't checked the quorum, but the good news is we don't have to have a quorum to have a discussion. That's true. We have to have a quorum to make a decision. Oh. <laughs> Um, OK, you this version that we're seeing on screen doesn't show the the IM team, right? It's not at the top of this. Are we already at the top of this list of yeah. this document? OK, for some reason it doesn't. You're right. It doesn't. Hmm. Well, that's OK. Um, well, first of all, thank you for um, for having our discussion today. It, it's been a timely discussion for us and and we we dealt with uh, and had the advantage of a great IM team consisting of about 12 people uh, for this uh, this uh, piece of advice. It's fiscal 2024 cleanup priorities, and um, this is similar in the series that we've developed over the years. They've, there have been some changes over the years, but consistently back many years, we've we've issued annual cleanup priorities type advice. Um, this year, we we did start off with uh, using last year's advice for 2023 uh, for the cleanup priorities as a guide because number one, it seemed to flow very smoothly, and secondly, um, DOE um, felt that it was a good representation and, and presentation of the material last year. So we. We tried to continue that uh, that vein of support and therefore use a similar format. We did make some changes to the background section uh, as was needed, and the primary focus has been on uh, the actual table that's included in this advice, uh, which lists the specific cleanup uh, activities and how we, if you will, prioritize them. And we'll go through that in a, in a minute, and um, and some discussion about the description of each of the items. So it's it's a continuation of the of a of a well established and chosen pathway that seems to be effective in terms of getting our cleanup priorities from HAB to the TPA agencies uh, going forward and ultimately to headquarters. So uh, as a result of that, I didn't prepare a specific presentation introduction this year because I thought most people. Uh, other than the new folks uh, that are joining us this year are generally familiar with this process. But as we go through this uh, on a paragraph by paragraph basis, I will explain um, how uh, what the paragraph is intended to do, why it's set up the way it is, and uh, we'll we'll move forward with that. I also don't see did we move the uh, the three references to the end route? I don't recall that, but I'm sure it's there there, but. Yeah, yeah. there they are. OK, uh, can, hold that for a moment, if you would. Oh, I wanted to, to chat I'm to start sorry. that. <laughs> no, I have to send you all drama mean. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> to start off with, uh, similar to what we've done in the past, we have listed the the specific uh, feed material that we use to develop this year's uh, cleanup priorities. And in this case, there are three of them. Uh, first is the past consensus device um, uh, number 309, which was the 2023 advice issued last March. The second one was the uh, the latest version of the DOE's Hanford five year plan, which was presented to us. Uh, it was dated October 11th. It was presented to us in October 2021 to the board uh, for discussion. And, and that is the latest version that was available that is available. So we've used that as a guide, and we also um, sent a, a letter to the the three uh, management personnel at each of the TPA organizations on our comments to that draft five year plan that is referenced in number two. So that that's the structure of uh, of how we began to feed in the updates to this year's advice. So now, Ruth, if you can go up to the beginning, sorry to back and forth you on that about people's eyesight. Yeah, <laughs> you'll notice that uh, again, uh, we are addressing this this uh, piece of advice to all three uh, leading managers at the TPA agencies. And in the background, uh, the first paragraph is really just introductory. 
uh, level talking about the, the 2024 focus. And I'll, I'll, we'll have a few words uh, on the second page of this advice uh, regarding that. Uh, and leading into the second paragraph that starts this assessment continues. Um, we mentioned that's where we mentioned the three references that I just pointed out to you and how we how we develop them, how we obtain them basically. The the next paragraph with the bullets uh, indicates that we continue to follow the same categorization of cleanup activities as DOE has used in the five year plan, both last year and also again this year. Uh, they they divide their uh, their five year plan up between tank waste cleanup, central plateau cleanup, and river corridor cleanup. And this year we we had a fourth category last year as well, which was named something different. But we we named that same category, if you will, indirect and supporting activities as our fourth category of uh, general activities uh, that you'll see in the table in a few minutes. Um, the next section with the two bullets involved uh, is almost identical uh, minus uh, one or two minor word changes that we used last year to define how we were prioritizing the cleanup activities. So uh, DOE is very interested in us prioritizing. They have been for quite some time. Up until last year, the board was reluctant to do that because the feeling was all of the cleanup activities are important to accomplish and we didn't want to uh, slight one in favor of another because they were all important to us. Last year, we began the, the prioritization in a two category system. The critical items, which are defined there, that they must, be, in our view, they must be funded in 2024 to assure completion as scheduled or to accelerate uh, uh, as the board feels is necessary for that completion of that activity. And the second category important is those activities which should be prioritized um, or at least to continue funding so that the TPA milestones can can be met in a future year as scheduled. So those kind of there, there, there are two distinctions. Critical is obviously the most um, the, the, the most important, if you will. Uh, the important category is also important, but of lesser to a lesser degree than the others. Um, the next, yeah, that's starting that paragraph during the board's October 20th meeting. This was a change and this was an addition uh, from last year. And it's because back in October when when DOE presented their five year plan to us uh, that was updated, the current one. Um, Brian Vance uh, commented to a question that uh, it might be a good idea to broaden the scope of the of the cleanup priorities advice that we typically issue to them to cover the entire range of years addressed in the five year plan. We considered that in the IM team and for these reasons we decided that it wasn't the appropriate way to go. So we decided we still want to focus on one specific fiscal year that's the that's called the um, the formulation year in the budget terminology which is two years out from the current fiscal year so fiscal year 2022 is what we are currently in this advice is dealing with fiscal 2024 because uh, this summer if you will doe will be sending in their input to headquarters to support the 2024 budget formulation so we we decided to stay with that focus on one fiscal year. The reasons are twofold as defined in the bullets. One is uh, a number of the activities that we're going to be talking about in the table uh, reflect an acceleration to what's shown in the DOE five year plan. And if we had all five years addressed as our scope, you would kind of lose the the uh, the direction, if you will, that have is providing to DOE that some should be accelerated sooner than what's shown in the five year plan. That's what that first bullet basically covers. Second bullet is um, in a similar fashion, we felt that broadening to the five year scope uh, would seem to lessen the focus to complete cleanup activities on a fiscal by fiscal year basis. 
So DOE and the five year plan addresses fiscal year by fiscal year activities. We felt we should do the same in our cleanup priorities advice. So for those reasons, we decided to stay with, we considered DOE's request. Actually, it wasn't a formal request, it was a comment, but we decided against that approach uh, for those reasons. So we got into the advice and and basically the these these three paragraphs cover the lead in to the table of a specific activities. Um, the first one is is uh, basically an introduction to the the direct advice, but we do make the statement in the second sentence that begins with the note note that the activities in the five year plan uh, are not uh, that are supposed to be finished before 2024 are not covered. Yeah, thank you, Ray. Uh, but if they are not completed prior to 2024, they should also be added to this list. That's put in because I know there were some delays in some activities because of COVID, COVID response and the shortage of workers. Uh, and some of those milestones were delayed or are being delayed. If the ones that we have addressed that are considered here are not finished and they were supposed to be finished before 2024. Uh, we're saying here that they should also be added to this list. Second paragraph is a, is a little more involved, but in essence, um, we recognize in this paragraph that the min safe activities and critical maintenance type activities are, are very important to be done and they feed all of the ability that DOE has to perform any cleanup activities. So without these min safe and critical maintenance type activities, infrastructure activities, um, we won't be able to do any cleanup at, at Hanford. So therefore they're, they're, if you will, one cut above the importance level of the actual cleanup activities. So we're recognizing that we did not try to identify all those very detailed specific items because there are a number of them in the five year plan that DOE does address in this regard. But in order to avoid that complexity and that confusion that it would add, we said if those are men safe or critical maintenance, we understand they have to be done and therefore uh, we support you doing those. We did add some wording in here. Um, if you go about halfway done, beginning with the sentence, the board assumes that these activities include um, uh, necessary, those necessary for personnel safety, the safe storage of tank waste and the tank integrity, integrity program in general, which is quite a large program, and establishing maintaining operational status of the evaporator. We put that that last phrase in there because there was some concern or some confusion as to the status of the 242A evaporator for operation. And and we wanted to recognize that getting that op, that evaporator in place and functional is very important and we feel that's part of the overall maintenance activities. So that's kind of summarized, summarizing that entire paragraph and that was the focus of that paragraph. We know you have to do those activities so we support that. And then in the spirit of transparency we, we put a plug in here that we would really appreciate. This is the third the last paragraph shown there. We would appreciate a response from each of the TPA managers that we're sending this to uh, as to whether or not they will or will not support the identified priorities uh, we list in the table. In the past, we 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 get a response from DOE, although not a detailed response, and we we seldom, I, I would say, get a response from the other TPA agencies. So we're encouraging them. Uh, to consider themselves part and party to receiving this advice, and 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 we're asking for their response as well. Okay, getting into the table. These are our cleanup recommended cleanup priorities. Uh, and two notes at the top: uh, the acronyms used throughout this table, instead of uh, lengthening the discussion in the limited space we have for the table, we put the acronyms defined at the end of the table. And the item column, the far left column in the table, is used as an identifier and in no way uh, is meant to establish any other priority other than what's mentioned in the second column from the left. That's the priority level, the critical versus important. So TW-A, for example, is the first item to be discussed in the tank waste cleanup 
section. That's that's basically the wording. Uh, before we get into the specifics here, are there any general comments on the, the background or the lead into this table? Most of the focus here and most of the focus on the IM team has been in this table itself. But uh, if you have any questions or comments on the back background, we'd I'd be happy to, to hear those now. If you, you can say them to later too. I've got uh, three folks on the phone. Well, one number is duplicated. So we've got three or four people on the phone. Um, anyone on the phone have a question, a comment, a concern? Don't have anybody in chat queue. Okay. Well, that's good. I think, I think we're okay for now. Sounds good. Yeah, you can always bring those comments up later too, but I wanted to try to wrap that part up uh, sooner rather than later if we could. Looking at the table then, the, there are three critical items shown here, the A, B, and C items for tank waste. The first obviously is DF law. And I think everyone would agree that that certainly is a critical item. It has all of the, fo all of the focus uh, uh, from DOE and the TPA agencies in general, as well as HAB to make sure we begin to process waste. The wording itself is was developed by the IM team because we um, we want to make sure this 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 is pushed uh, to as early as possible begin operations and reach full capacity. So it says operate DF law and increase throughput to reach full capacity levels uh, for waste vet vetrification. And we put the total in there. Uh, as as our understanding of what full capacity is, 21 metric tons of glass per year. Um, this is fiscal 2024, which starts October 2023 and goes till September 2024. Um, some of the discussion from DOE has has said that uh, they may not um, uh, begin operations until late calendar year 2024. Uh, so that would be the next fiscal year, if you will. So this represents uh, an acceleration of effort beyond what is shown in the five year plan to some extent. Uh, second item uh, single shell tank leak detection, characterization, mitigation, and cleanup, and the communication plan. Um, we're asking that uh, the DOE complete a plan to address the process for single shell tank leaks. Uh, this is uh, this is the subject of of the next advice that you'll be talking about today. After after this session, there is a separate advice item on on tank leakage and uh, and how we handle that. But this is to reflect a, con a continuity, if you will, between this advice and the next one. And similarly, those same comments apply to this third item, uh, leaking single shell tank retrieval. Uh, initiate a retrieval retrieval activities for single shell tanks known to be leaking. Um, we have we have a number of those, at least one recent one, and as I understand, some other single shell tanks are known to be leaking. Um, we we would like to to make sure that the retrieval occurs of the liquids from those tanks as quickly as possible. Uh, TWD, Tom, yes. So let's stop with the, the 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 critical ones. I've got some folks in queue and sort of um, okay work with them and then go to the important ones under tank waste. Sort you of bet. chunking them up. Um, Esteban. And Steve and Steve, two Steves. Esteban. Yeah, so I think that so that's a question I would ask of Tom. I keep rehearing that the communications with DOE, it's a major concern. So just your feedback on and thoughts about how communication be has been with officials, especially when stuff like that's like you said about now that some tanks are leaking and the work is starting and then at the end because it is going to depend on the money right because we the report that happens to the political leaders about what's happened and you know what are we going to say and that on the work that's happening 
regarding us getting more funds to me that's the thing that kind of stands out too is like what's the because i keep hearing that the community about that being a concern of the communications with doe well <clears throat> yeah there are a couple of aspects of uh, communication esteban in general on on communicating things like leaking tanks and so forth i think that's been fairly fairly good in my view uh, in, in other words, if, so, if an occurrence happens at, uh, at, at Hanford, DOE is, is fairly well on top of that and communicates that with the HAB. The other communication issue related to that is, is how the HAB communicates with DOE and vice versa. And that, I think, needs, needs some work yet. Uh, so from the standpoint of money, available money, absolutely. Uh, no, ha no Hanford activity cleanup can occur without the money. So it all starts with the money that's appropriated from Congress. Uh, we can do little to impact that, except to to highlight our concerns and needs for cleanup. <clears throat> and the local DOE does not have a lot of uh, uh, a lot of uh, ability to influence the final dollar figure uh, either. I don't believe. So the money is important. Um, we need to do everything we can to boost that budget. Uh, it's an ongoing issue for communications. All right, I have Steve Anderson and then Steve Wigman. Steve. Yeah, I guess I just wanted to make sure there's a clarification. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Yes, yeah. we can. Yes, we can. The, uh, <laughs> Tom, I don't know if you uh, meant to say uh, 21 metric tons of glass per year, but we have down per day. Oh. I just want to make sure that oh. Oh. statistic oh. is what we're saying is what we understand it to be. And the oh, okay. DFL. Uh, that's, that's, that's. Chris, Chris Sutton, Chris, uh, if you're on board, can you can you respond? Can you, can you respond? Yeah. The yeah. first page. Yeah, first Steve. Page. The first page of the, the five-year five plan, five plan has as a goal as for FY 2022 and FY 2026 to initiate tank waste treatment via DF law, ramping up to 21 metric tons of glass per day, generating up to 3,000 LAW glass containers. So it, as long as that, as long as that, on the five-year plan is correct five plan. and what we have is correct. Chris, if, if you've got a phone and a, a microphone on, we're getting some feedback from you. Perfect. Thanks, Chris. I, I kind of thought it was uh, just he just misspoke um, that it, it was going to be 21 metric tons per day, but I just wanted to make sure since he said per year. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Oh, sorry. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, thank you. All right, Steve Wigman. I'm curious about the single shell tank leakage and retrieval of leaking tanks. <clears throat> We've not yet issued advice or heard back from DOE regarding single shell tanks, except for Brian's statement that the, particularly the first one, the added risk from B109 leaking is not a significant enough issue to cause that retrieval to be accelerated. Uh, now you've put retrieval of single shell tank uh, leakage above the waste treatment plant for high level waste. From a risk perspective, I mean, there may be different views legally and from a regulatory perspective, from a risk perspective, I would not agree with that. Yeah, you're saying you'd you you think it should be important as opposed to critical. That's yeah, that's TWC. TWC below um, the WTP. Well, keep keep in mind WTP is listed as important only because it's it's a uh, 15 years out, 14 years out yet. And it's important enough to make sure that we continue funding activities. The leaky tanks are with us now. 
But if you decide that the retrieval of single shell tanks that are leaking is more important than treating double shell tanks, the money is going to come from the double shell tanks. So something that DOE has determined isn't enough of a risk to cause that change. But we don't need to get into that debate right now. But as an old timer, I believe that, in fact, we knew those tanks were going to leak when we stopped retrieving the liquids from them because we couldn't get any more out. And if DOE were to decide to, decide to uh, place the retrieval of leaking tanks in advance of preparing to treat double shell tanks, which are also preparing to fail, then we would be spending money on a lower risk item. That's a valid point. I, I, what I'd suggest is we hold that discussion until uh, the next advice, because that's going to be talking about the leaky tanks and the issues directly related to that. Okay. We can I'm come back. We can come back and consider changing that to too important if, if, if that discussion turns out to be that way. Okay. Thanks. You bet. Okay, looking at the four or so, I think four or five. Okay, five important items in the tank waste area. Uh, single shell tank retrieval again is uh, is an item. Uh, this is now consistent with the five year plan for DOE. Complete the AX form retrieval, initiate A form retrieval. That's an item that's in their five year plan. Uh, the WTP that Steve just mentioned, uh, the waste treatment plant for high level waste. Uh, we listed this as important as, as I was just beginning to mention because uh, the actual completion date for that milestone is something like 2036. But we don't want to lose focus on the need to continue all activities that are required to support that date. So that's that's why it was positioned up to this point the way it was. And again, we can come back and revisit after the next discussion of the advice in the uh, about the tank waste. Uh, East West transfer line. Uh, we we wanted to highlight this again this year to complete activities to put the two East West tank transfer line into service. It's not immediately needed. Because they uh, the DF law is going to work off of uh, uh, other sources of inform of uh, contaminated waste uh, in order to to begin operations, but it is needed ultimately, and we don't want to have that delayed uh, very long at all. We want that capability in place to have a, tr a workable transfer line. Again, that transfer line is meant to tie the 200 east with the 200 west tank farms. So that when we begin operation of DF law and ultimately uh, high level waste activities in WTP, we'll have a free flow of, of materials between the two tank farm, major tank farm areas. Uh, TWG is tank vapors. We, we had some discussion on this. Um, we decided to keep this in, even though we haven't heard much in the news or in our tab discussions recently about uh, uh, concern for personnel safety, worker safety related to tank vapors. But we knew uh, dating back a year or a year and a half ago now, the DOE was pursuing some engineered uh, vapor controls. And we haven't heard anything uh, recently about those. So we wanted to make sure that that's still included. It's still an issue. We want to make sure that we protect the workers however we can. It's a safety related issue. And finally, in this section, additional tank storage. This is one that uh, perennially has come up from the HAB and perennially has has uh, not been supported by DOE. Uh, the, their, the justification from DOE, as I understand it, has been that uh, they don't think they need it based on their assessment of the space available for handling and transferring uh, current tank waste between tanks and to the, the vitrification facilities. Uh, and so an additional tank uh, is not needed and it would draw money and time resources away from actual cleanup activities. That's the basis for, as I understand it, for non-support from DOE. Our concern with this from the HAB perspective is 
we're we're only one major leak away from from catastrophe if one of these tanks goes and and the fact that they're beyond their design life currently is is of real concern so we continue to list this we've We've only listed it as important, but we think it is something that has to be considered. And we're only addressing here um, design and permitting activities, not construction. So we'd like to see that those activities proceed. All right. So we've got some some folks in queue about this these five things. I've got Steve Wigman and Mike Karenka. Okay. Thank you. Uh, just a, a question that relates probably to a message sent by the additional tank storage. Um, in the references that you looked at as to what DOE was planning to do, uh, can we identify which of these are not in their plans? Because I don't think additional tank storage design is in their plans. Not to say we shouldn't have it there, but can we identify what we know is in their plans and what we know is not in their plans? You, you're talking about the five year plan? Well, let's I'm just talking specifically about the additional tank storage. If that is not in any of their plans, including the five year plan, we to help us understand what we're saying it would seem beneficial to identify whether it's in any of their planning or not. I my my answer to that, and I, I'll defer to Bob uh, for Tank Waste Committee uh, detailed discussions that may have occurred. My understanding is DOE has worked out the process of transferring waste back and forth between tanks as the operation for vitrification proceeds and it is of the opinion that they do not need additional storage. No, well, I, I recognize that. My my question relates to our understanding of all of the items that we're prioritizing and whether or not those items are somewhere in DOE plans, where in this case it is not in their plans for a reason, but we can't tell by the way you've written it which ones are, are referenced from their planning work and which ones are not. Uh, okay, I'm not sure I completely understand. See, Bob, do you do you have anything to add on that? Um, from what Steve said, uh, the additional tank storage is not in any of their plans, and Steve's asking us to somehow flag which ones are in their plans and which ones are not. Is that right, Steve? That's correct to help the communication process of both our board members and also the recipients as to whether we're talking about needing to add something to their priorities or just modify where it's placed in their priorities. And this is an example where we're adding something to their priorities, like with single shell tank leak response. Yeah, I'm not we challenging that it's there. I'm just challenging that I get lost trying to understand what's in their plans out somewhere and what's not in their plans at all. Yeah, Steve, one comment I'll make on that is uh, in two years ago, we did modify our format a bit to. Uh, I'm not sure what you're doing there, Ruth, but uh, <laughs> two years ago, we had a, uh, a cleanup priorities advice list uh, initiated and it was based on uh, items that are in the five year plan and we listed those that we supported uh, going forward. Items that were not in the plan that should be in the plan and um, we listed those separately. That was our approach to try and prioritize at that time with DOE and it didn't it didn't go. It wasn't well received. So we we disbanded the idea of trying to say, well, this item's in, this item's not. This item is an acceleration. Instead of getting into that detail, we said, what is important to us as a have? And that's what shows up in our table. So I can't, yeah, we could probably answer you on each item as to whether or not it's in or out. 
but we didn't specifically show that. I'm not asking you to answer me. I'm just asking if you'd be willing to make it clear in our in our advice that we recognize that some of these things are not in their planning. Oh, we did. Well, we do say that in the advice uh, lead in. I think that's. Uh, where did I say that? Some of the some of these are accelerations. Where did we? I'll have to search for that word, but I can't see it on the screen. Um, and we could actually add a sentence if it's not clear enough in this section of advice. Yeah, the word, the the text uh, before the table. No, no, not that far back. But in the in the text before the table, there we can say when we talked about the 2024. That's what Ruth was highlighting. Sorry, Ruth. Right. Yeah. If I, I was yeah, if items were not uh, uh, finished as they were supposed to be before 2024, then they should also be done. We do say that, but we don't specifically say what's in and what's out. All I'm asking is for something like an asterisk or something that when you go through the list, you can immediately know if it's in their plans or not. If others disagree with that, I'll maybe back off, but it would sure help me understand. I think we can do that, Steve. The, the only the only hesitation I would have to say we can is that a number of these items are in their plan but represent an acceleration. Some are not in their plan. Most of them are in their plan. So it would always be a threefold designation somehow. It's in the plan, it's out of the plan, it's acceleration of the plan. Yeah. We can probably it's do those. that. Each of those distinctions would be of value in understanding what we're communicating. OK, let, let me see what we can do with that uh, for tomorrow's version, hopefully. Thank you. I have Mike Karenko. Thank you for waiting, Mike. Yeah, thank you. I'm kind of listening from a thousand foot level, and I'm wondering if by uh, this discipline categorization of waste, we may have missed an obvious crosstalk priority, uh, which is very high in my mind. And and go back to Tom's comment, uh, it was a catastrophic leak of a single cell tank. A thousand, ten thousand, hundred thousand gallons leak out. My question is, why is that catastrophic? It goes into the Vado cell. Where's the Vado zone cleanup priority? So the 100,000 in this scenario joins the millions that we're doing nothing about. Nothing is an exaggeration, but why isn't the Vado zone cleanup a high enough priority where it categorized, stuck in this categorization box? Why isn't the Vado zone cleanup a high priority of tanks that linked in the past? That's my rhetorical cross link question. Yeah, Ruth is highlighting, I think, what might apply to that. Um, and that is the groundwater cleanup to, you know, we're saying that's in the next category, accelerate remediation and groundwater cleanup and river corridor. Is that what we compensate? Is, is that not you the include Vados techniques? At one time, years ago, we we're talking about Vados development techniques. I, I just don't hear much about that subject. It's not in the right category. You know, yeah, so. I don't know that we've mentioned Vados directly now that you mentioned that. Yeah, we might have to consider that. Well, I'm just that's just the thought. Thank you. OK, thanks. Thanks. So, Mark. Jan, I, I know you're here um, as leadership for RAP, so um, we will probably ask you about that when we get down. <clears throat> OK, let's look at. Um, Central Plateau. Is, is oh, there wait a minute. Else? Uh, Chris, you've got your hand up. Chris Sutton? Yes. Um, to answer uh, the comments on the Vado Sound, we do actually we do actually address it as a critical item um, in the Central Plateau cleanup under CP-C. Under pump and treat, it says maintain, optimize, and expand current groundwater PNT program capabilities and operations. Expand pump and treat to BP5, PO1, and address deep Vado zone contamination. Yes, so we, we, did, we did address it in that context. Thanks, Chris. I had forgotten about that, I, that Vado's mentioned. All right. And 
and Jan is here if we've got wrap questions as well. Cool. Let's keep going to Central Plateau critical items. Ah, they won't all fit on one screen. That's OK. okay. That's OK. Uh, <laughs> first is WESIF. We've talked about this a great deal over the years and uh, it continues to be a critical priority for us. And this is an acceleration uh, to what's in in the uh, five year plan by one year, basically. Accelerate activities to complete construction permitting and, and this is the acceleration part, and to safely initiate and complete physical transfer of the capsules. That was planned on being completed in 2025 by DOE in the five year plan. And so this represents an acceleration. Uh, the, the wording there uh, about the workforce is important because, because this is a critical item. We want to make sure that the workforce has some continuity uh, and we don't lose personnel that are, have been trained and experienced in this activity because the activity is being uh, extended out uh, further than we would like. Uh, Tom, I'm, I'm going to give you a time check. We're about 15 minutes away from. OK, I'm going to have to hustle through this then. If you have I'm a sorry. question, uh, please, please raise it and we'll we'll try to move on as quickly as possible. The second one, the basin concrete evaluation was one suggested originally by Richard Bloom and considered by Rob Davis and Richard and and um, to some extent, Tom Cecilia as well. Um, and the wording there is that it's possible that we can gain a lot of information from the concrete uh, in the basin once it's emptied uh, to advance the knowledge of uh, irradiated concrete strength. I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that and continue on. That's what that item was about. Pump and treat, we just mentioned earlier, that is critical. It's, it's been doing a great job for Hanford. And we want to see that not only continue, but expanded as much as possible. We didn't list specifics there. Um, we, we'd rather leave that to uh, to a, a detailed engineering evaluation, but we want to see that continued and expanded. Uh, Central Waste uh, Complex is uh, it was in last year as well. We still think is critical. Um, we changed the words to say that that we should be supporting the TPA agreements and deadlines to bring all wastes into compliance uh, for removal from the site. Basically, that's what that says. We don't want to get caught with a schedule that is finally given to us for, for shipping this waste off site that we can't meet because it's not we're not ready. So we want to see that activity that's in our control be done. Uh, Erd of support. We uh, we felt that, in fact, the note says the remediation could be a central plateau or river corridor. It could be in either way. But since IRDF is a central plateau issue, we put it into the central plateau region. And we think that that we think that that's important. It's critical to do. Uh, Offsite waste shipments, uh, we mentioned some of those. Uh, complete engineering assessment. Um, for shipments off site to assure our place in line is protected. Again, that's a scheduled issue. What what gets shipped to um, to WIP, for example, and when that's supposed to occur? We want to make sure we meet those schedules, and those schedules are clearly defined. They seem to be very loose at this point, based on the incidents that had occurred at WIP in the past and and upgrades that they were required to do, as well as other needs at WIP. The cribs are important to us. Um, we wanted to the, these words are are consistent with the five year plan to begin remedial activities in those specific cribs that are identified consistent with the schedule. Um, T and B plants remove begin removal actions for the T and B plants themselves. Um, not much definition there, but we didn't feel that we should be getting into too much detail with the OE on that. The waste characterization. Uh, again, this is consistent with the DOE five year plan. I'll kind of skip over that because of that issue. Orphan wastes are, are one that has been 
discussed fairly frequently within the HAB and with DOE recently. Uh, evaluate the generation and plan disposal of all waste streams, even those that don't have a clear disposition path. And we mentioned several examples. Now, I just heard the other day in one of our meetings that uh, a DOE representative uh, disagreed with Tisker ion exchange columns being uh, orphan waste because there is some plan to handle them. But I don't know that plan, and I don't think our IM, IM team did either. So I would suggest we leave Tisker in as an example, um, as one of the examples at least. Uh, DOE can, and in fact, I would hope would respond to that to, to define it better. Okay, I'm gonna jump ahead, River Corridor. Um, have... One question. I've got Steve Wigman in queue, Steve. Yeah, I had two, one back on IRTF. We uh, are talking about using contaminated soil rather than clean soil. Have we actually had discussions with DOE on that and we issued any advice? Um, I don't believe there's advice on that. The dis there was a discussion, and I can't remember which meeting, um, but RAP has had um, a bit of a discussion on that. Jan, do you have better memory than I do? Well, I can affirm that it has been an ongoing issue, um, that it's a waste of, of clean fill that we should be using fill that is contaminated in that area. But if you, you know, honestly, I can't tell you whether it ever made it into advice or not, but I know that uh, the question has been raised more than once. Okay, my, my issue there is that there's a lot of reasons as a engineer that I would prefer to use clean soil because you need less water to keep the contamination from moving around. So, I've, we've never had a discussion, so I've never really got clarity on what the issues are. Um, so I don't necessarily agree that we should be using contaminated soil. Um, and then on, where was it? Further down, now I'm lost. Oh, orphan waste. I think orphan waste is a very big issue, and I agree that we need to be dealing with it. I would suggest that it might be worthy to uh, generate some advice specifically on these wastes that we believe could be orphan waste, um, or at least initiate discussions on them. Because, uh, yeah, I, yeah, you could you could grind these columns up and. Put them in the vit plan. I don't believe that's a good idea. So I, may I just say that I think that part of the problem with discussing orphan waste is that we will have a lot of difficulty in getting briefed on it. I don't. I, think, yeah, I don't disagree with you. That's that's a problem. Um, but I think we're going to be nervous about those ion exchange columns until we really know what their risk is. Uh, we don't know how long they're going to last. We don't know how long they think they're going to store them. They've got some nasty stuff in them. Um, so, in the interest of both giving you good news and time, um, the draft agenda we're working on for the committee as a whole in May includes an orphan waste topic. Okay, good. So, Steve, are you okay with leaving this item in? Yes. Okay. Okay, good. Okay, River Corridor, I'm just going to breeze through these now. I think 324 building is a hot topic for all of us, including DOE. Uh, we want to complete required prep and begin remediation of underlying soils, which is an acceleration from DOE's five-year plan. Uh, they were talking about putting in a finishing completion of the of the micropiles and so forth. And uh, we would we want to see begin remediation of the soils in this year. Groundwater cleanup is listed as critical, as we've talked about before. Um, we can refer up to the other one instead of saying, well, we can leave it as, does Does this include vetas? We can refer to the other item in the previous category by text, and we can do that. Uh, 100 N rod, uh, we, that's that's an important item we think is, is already covered uh, by the 
a five year plan that they, they say they will complete the, the 100 end rod and begin demolition of uh, 105 K, K West Basin. And I believe that that's also consistent with the five year plan. I don't think that's a, an acceleration, but we can check that. The indirect and supporting activities are kind um, of. Expensive. Tom, take a breath. Okay. Hey, no, I told you to hurry up and then I got people in queue. <laughs> um, sorry. Um, Dave Enan, there is a comment on clean soil versus dirty soil. I'm going to let Dave express that himself and then we'll go to Shelly. Yeah, just really quick. We do want the dirty, the contaminated soil for Erdf, Um, and it's primarily about using up the airspace and the Erdf capacity. Um, we want to use contaminated soil rather than dirty so or yeah, than clean soil. Um, in terms of handling, doesn't make any difference in the 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 water that the, that's being applied is as much for getting good compaction as it is for dust control. So again, that doesn't it that's not really a factor um, and everything inside the cell is is a zone anyway so I mean, yes we have to use a bit of clean soil at the night or at night or when there's winds but as a top cover but for for compaction around debris and stuff really want the contaminated soil so that's that's an important value for us thank you dave can't you Appreciate just make that so do we have to be involved in that You'd think, but we're struggling to get that. That the okay. You know. I just thought you had the authority since it's a circle facility to say so. You'd think, okay. but we're okay. not like successful. That, it is def is definitely a topic of discussion. Uh, Shelley. Oh. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Great. Thanks, Ruth. Um, I was in the queue because of exactly what Dave Enan said. We we need uh, dirty soil. There's no doubt about it. And uh, for Erdf, and that's something that we need to to really. That's the eye on the prize. And what that I I think you know what that means to when I think of that is that we need uh, more low hanging fruit remediation and uh more soil remediation and probably d and d and uh and uh of buildings and so forth so that we can get that compaction and 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 uh ultimate disposition for a lot of the stuff that we've put on site so i think that's really important the other thing i had my hand raised about is uh the uh veto zone can we go back to that one do we in here anywhere, Tom? I think we missed it. Talk about deep veto zone and going after perched lakes and you know deep veto zone, something that alludes to deep veto zone uh, remediation and optimization of the pump and treats to accommodate uh, deeper uh, contamination. I don't Thank think you. that's mentioned, other than what you said there on that previous item on. Uh, oh, it's right there on the deep, deep veto zone. Oh, OK. That, yeah, that that is per the. Um, five year plan, basically. That's great. OK, I just I for some reason I couldn't focus on that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Glad to see it. OK. So where are we now? Uh, we are oh, we are so, indirect and we got three minutes. Um, let me just highlight the, uh, hopefully you've had a chance to look at some of the word, specific wording, but there are four, I think four or five categories in this section, ISA, A, B, C, D at least. Workforce issues, all these items that are mentioned here refer to making sure we have a trained, qualified and adequate workforce for the various, uh, for various cleanup tasks that we are addressing here. And uh, we have offered I guess six or so of the specifics on what we th think would be appropriate to, to to support that activity. I won't go through all these. If you see something that you want to comment on, please feel free to let me let me finish going through the four. We get down to ASI, ASAB, ASAB. Five of them, but yeah. 
five of them. Okay, worker safety, I forgot we had to put that in. We decided to put this in as a generalized item. We debated that for a while, but worker safety is critical. The only debate was DOE already puts worker safety front and center in all activities, but we thought it would be worth the issue and worth saying that it's critical to all of us. Uh, expanded HAB and public involvement is an important item. We constantly hear support from DOE local as well as DOE headquarters in various presentations that they have made uh, that says that public involvement is critical to their success. Um, sometimes, sometimes we see actions that don't seem to support that. So we wanted to highlight these four items uh, at least uh, as specific, so we think we can expand and improve upon public uh, public involvement. And finally, oh, there's two more, sorry. The Hanford funding support is an item that we added. Uh, we are concerned that because we're moving into operational activities, uh, particularly meaning uh, Tisker and DF law in general uh, by the year 2024, that 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 operational switch is going to absorb some money out of that 2.6 billion dollar assumed funding level per year and we're concerned that that's going to draw off funding support for the remaining site cleanup that we have many of which are critical as we've just gone through 324 building uh, pump and treat a number of other areas wesif so we would like doe to provide a, a, a detailed assessment, if you will, a plan on how they how this change in operation versus cleanup uh, as part of the cleanup is going to affect the funding levels. That's what that item is meant to address. And then, then overall site funding. Um, we we put this item in because there is a distinction between RL and ORP, with ORP getting the vast majority of funding in each annual fiscal year uh, funding appropriation. Uh, but yet a lot of our critical activities are in, in, uh, in the RL realm. So we want to make sure DOE, we, want, we would like DOE's assurance that the RL cleanup is going to be fully funded to meet the TPA milestones in addition to all that we're doing for ORP. It's that, it's that, that's the focus of that last item. Uh, there are a couple things that we have mentioned here that I've taken some notes on and Ruth has too, that we, we will modify the wording to tonight. Uh, is there any other comment that, that you have at this point and whether or not we should move this forward to tomorrow? I was gonna say, you, you nailed it right on time, Tom. Um, oh thank, my God. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for running faster, <laughs> um, but you are correct. So the, the question before the board is, you'll want to see this tomorrow to adopt with some of the, the clarifications that you talked about. So I am going to ask the, the reverse question. Is there anybody who objects to moving this forward to tomorrow's session? the feedback part. I think silence I, is golden. I think I think it is, but I just want to make <laughs> sure there's a long enough pause that if anybody does object, they have a chance to, to speak up. Thanks for all the effort that went into this. The team did a great job on this. So I, I thank you all and thank you for your comments today. All right. Rob, what's on your mind? Yeah, I was going to ask the question. We did talk about Erdif there, and um, isn't uh, Erdif a, a technical trench lined with lysimeters and uh, a lot of technical stuff? So our concerns for uh, con 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 contamination escaping there is pretty minimal, is it not? Wouldn't we all agree that? No. In, in an, is Erdif an engineered kind of facility? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, Absolutely, it's engineered, and it's really more about airborne, windblown. That our concerns for. Yeah, that's what that's what we, Steve, okay, Steve we, was talking about. 
So we have concerns when we have an open trench and when we complete one of the cells, we close it, correct? Correct. And we're, we're no longer concerned about the airboard for that cell, right? Right. Okay. And and it and the, it it gets nightly cover and so so forth. So it's just yeah. It's a well it's a well run trench setup, isn't it? It's made Absolutely. for what it, we want to use it for. And and um, okay, I just making sure that we're we're all understand that you know we got some good stuff out there. So anyway, thank you. Thanks. So uh, let's. You guys are, are being great today. Um, I know it's been a while since the board did three pieces of advice in any meeting, virtual or in person. So it's, um, I know it's a tough day. So let's take a break till 2.45. We'll shorten it up a little bit. And we will do draft advice number three on tank leaks. So, um, Take a couple laps around the living room because there's one more to go. <laughs> Thank you. Well, what do you say? Are we ready to rock? I think we're ready to rock. Let's see. Let's make this so you can actually read the print. Teams doesn't let you all just the print the way go to did. Make it a little paper. All right. So the last thing today is same song, different verse. Drafted by. Um, and again, the question at the end is go, no go for considering it tomorrow. So Jeff, it's all yours. Thank you. I actually have some slides that are probably going to look pretty familiar to you all, but I thought I would remind everyone you know, where this came from and the process that it's been through. Uh, should just take a few minutes here. Uh, can everyone see my screen all right? Great. OK, thank you. Uh, what you see here on the screen is a revised timeline. Uh, you would have seen this back in December. We stretched it out a few months. Uh, this describes the timeline of this advice's development. Uh, it began nearly a year ago with the discovery um, and the notice from DOE that a single shell tank had begun to actively leak. Uh, this is different from the, I lose count of how many single shell tanks are, are known past leakers in that this was actively uh, releasing liquid into the environment. Uh, we began talking about it in May in the Tank Waste Committee. Uh, we started putting together and, and talking through kind of what some values might be, um, tried to put together a table of what some options might be and what the information needs were and those kinds of things, really as just a conversation starting piece. Uh, a couple months later, there was a draft of advice to look through that passed Tank Waste Committee uh, consensus or concurrence rather. Uh, and in September was the first time that we as a full board talked about the single shell tank leak advice. DOE at that meeting also uh, came and talked to us and Karthik uh, from the contractor side came and answered some of our questions. Uh, and at that discussion, we had some questions that there didn't appear to be some ready answers to. Uh, however, due to the, the membership issues at that time, we as a board decided not to do voting at that meeting. And so we just took feedback and we took it back to the issue management team, revised it, came back in December. And for those of you who recall who were there, um, there were a lot of things that seemed to speak to people on the board, but there were also some concerns uh, some that were content related and organization related and some that just wanted to give the agencies a little more time to try to sort it out themselves because they were actively talking about what they wanted to do about the B109 leak. Um, I was kind of hoping we'd hear something this morning from the agencies and um, you know if if there is something to report maybe uh, chime in in the queue here so we know that there is something. 
Uh, however, we we took the feedback that we heard from that meeting. Uh, we talked again in late December, worked through January to revise this advice again. Uh, it passed through the Tank Waste Committee again, and here we are. Um, so this was the original uh, main points of the proposed advice. I won't go through each one because we changed it and we made some adjustments based on what we heard at the September meeting. And I won't spend a lot of time on this one either because we changed it again. Uh, and this was in response to feedback from the group uh, who had a couple of things to say, and I'll try to paraphrase that. In essence, there were too many advice points, and let's really focus on the development of a plan, uh, which that second advice point is all about this piece of advice of let's have a plan that is forward looking, that is watching the the water ahead and, and looking for those issues and trying to be proactive about mitigating tank leaks. Um, we also added this first main point uh, just beginning with a very basic belief that the agencies ought to remove liquid waste, including the interstitial liquid in the tanks, as soon as possible before they have a chance to leak. Um, we can go through each one of these advice points. Um, hopefully you all have had a chance to read this advice. And, you know, if you haven't read it in a while, you may find that it's pretty different from the last time that you read it. Uh, we took a fair amount out of the background and put it to an appendix at the end. We were trying to split the difference between uh, some of our newer members who were saying, you know, the background is really helpful context to understand where this advice came from and what some of the driving factors were alongside the feedback that we were receiving from others that it was too long and let's get to the point already. Uh, so we we tried to thread that needle there. Uh, that is the essence of just the advice itself. If anyone would like a review of what happened at B109 and, and what else is going on and behind the scenes, I'm happy to talk about that too, but we have limited time. So I guess I'll, I'll return it back to the group. Okay. I've got an update from David Bowen. Let's start there. Good afternoon. Thanks, Jeff, for the invite uh, <laughs> to see if there's any kind of an update or not. Um, it has to be really high level still. Um, we are in the middle of drafting an agreement. Um, the elements are consistent with both this advice and what I just saw in the previous priorities advice as well. Um, so I, what I'll do is I'll just tell you what the elements are and I won't go into detail of what's associated with them, but a, a site-wide SST leaking tank response plan, intrusion investigations, analysis of active ventilation, whether it be appropriate or not at this particular tank, interim barrier installation, infrastructure and technology development, um, discussion on retrieval sequencing to see if they can be prioritized based on everything else going on on site, kind of what that last discussion was about before the break. And then um, an investigation into resistivity leak detection and monitoring systems to see if there's something that's sensitive enough to um, catch, you know, tens and hundreds of gallons rather than thousands. So those are the elements of what we're we're talking about, and it's being drafted right now. I'm hoping to get a a draft over to Energy to have a review by the end of the week. Thank you. And I've got a queue of interested folks. Did we lose? Oh, it's because it was your screen, not mine. Sorry. Too many computers running. There, there. So let's start with the queue. Um, Pam, Steve Wigman, and Bob. Pam. Thank you. Um, I would like to suggest um, renumbering. Um, I really feel that um, under advice two uh, points E and F are they're not part of a of a plan, um, which is the heading to develop a comprehensive plan. They're talking about technology development. 
So I would propose that E and F be the new number two. And um, number three would be development of a comprehensive plan with the bullets that follow. Um, I have been an advocate of technology development for a really long time, and I was really pleased uh, to hear that that is part of the discussion. Um, it's something that can begin um, relatively soon uh, versus putting in a transfer line or something like that. And we need that technology to deal with this material. So that is my suggestion. Thank you. Ruth, I'll make the same offer as before that if you'd like me to drive uh, with the document sharing screen, I'm happy to do so. Oh, I would love that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Does that sound as desperate as like, oh, oh my gosh. Yes. Um. <laughs> You'll see that I've done what Pam just suggested by bringing develop abatement technologies. This is E and this was F, and I just put them together as number two. Steve Wigman. Yeah, obviously I've, I've been a little bit of an obstacle in getting this advice completed. There was two issues I had last time. One was a potential lawsuit by one of our members, and the other was the fact that this was already in regulatory discussion. I'm just curious, has anything changed in that venue that would make the advice timely now? Or where, where do we stand on the on the actual value of issuing this advice? Steve, are you asking that of board members and their opinion? Or are you asking that of PPA agencies or all of the above? <laughs> we all of the above, but thank you for that clarification. Anybody that has it, it has it. <laughs> this is Rob. I would Rob. venture to I would venture to say that that because the advice is trying to look forward for the next five year plan or the next five years, looking forward, what do we got to do policy wise to make this happen? So any time is going to be a good time to issue this. I think the more current, the better. Um, thanks. Other responses to Steve's question about the timeliness of the advice. Susan. I think this advice is very timely right now, Steve. Uh, and the changes that Pam has asked for make a lot of sense. It clarifies things. I'm always, I've always been a believer in shorter advice is better. Um, when we, put such long strings behind our advice, it gives lots of distractive uh, rationale and our responses from the agencies. It's usually matches the length of our advice. So it's just something I, I love the words and I'm a word person, I, the verbiage is nice, but I, uh, that being said, I would vote for this in a heartbeat. It is time, it's reasonable. We've asked them to develop a plan. We've asked in this advice. None of this is contradictory to getting the most out of taxpayer dollars to reduce risk. Um, and it's all actionable. Um, I think it's time. Sen uh, I really, and I like the way that it has developed and matured. And uh, I think it, I think it's ready. Thanks. Other responses to Steve's question about the timeliness of the advice? And you can respond if you're a board member or a TPA staff <laughs> person. So, so Ruth, Ruth. This, this is Bob. Um, and my question, and I think I'm next in the queue, you are. is identical to Steve's, but I was uh, wondering if Dave Bowen would like to comment on if we turned out this advice, is it going to help in their negotiations? You'll have public input and they'll kind of re reinforce some of the things you guys are trying to do. Thanks, Bob, for teeing that up. Um, you know, I. 
as a tri-party agency, I try really hard not to influence the the guidance and the advice coming out of the HAB. Um, it's not going to hurt anything. I think, you know, I didn't follow the advice specifically as I was working with the Department of Energy and, and coming to agreement on something. Um, but as I, as it started coming together, I took a chance to look back and forth and it's not worded exactly the same and it doesn't cover absolutely everything that's in the advice, but it is consistent with it. So, um, you know, it, it doesn't hurt anything. Um, and I don't necessarily feel like I need leverage right now either, though. So it's really up to you guys what you what you want to do with this advice. So, OK, honestly. thank you. OK. Right, I have Jerry and Jeff in queue. Jerry. Um, and uh, I want to say I appreciate. Let me lower my hand here before I forget. OK, um, I, res I appreciate that response, Dave, that you know, you're not looking to influence the board as an agency receiving the advice. Uh, that's uh, very commendable and appreciate that. Um, uh, I assume it, one of the reasons why this news actually increases urgency for adoption to me is we keep forgetting that one of our major roles is not just to the fact, advise you as an agency or three agencies, but it's also to inform and help the public to be involved in the current process. So if there's going to be an agreement, having the board, having now put in a year of work on this advice, put forward principles of what um, it is looking for um, will be invaluable for public participation. And um, I just want to say, you know, it seems to me like all the more timely with um, this announcement. All right, Jeff, you had your hand up. I did, I do. Um, just a question for the HAB. Wouldn't you love to get a response from the agencies that says, good advice, we're doing most of it. And for those <laughs> things that we can't do, here is why. Uh, wouldn't wouldn't that be just really nice? Um, so that would be my advocacy for let's move forward. But also, we're not done talking here today, and I would really like to hear the perspectives of the other board members to see if this is reflective of board values. So thank you. That is that is a hint for some of our new members. Don't let just a few do all the talking. We want to hear from you, Chris. I think one of the one of the key terms uh, in this advice, and a good reason why it should go forward, is under um, 2B, uh, timely assessment and communication of single shell tank leaks. And it's the word timely that I think is really key, because I think that's one of the things that that have board members have felt in discussion of this uh, over the last year is that maybe timely uh, hadn't really occurred. Uh, that's to the public, to the HAB, to the agencies about the leak. So I think by stressing the word timely, I think that's a key element of this, of, of, of this advice. Right. Steve Wigman, um, good. You've got your hand up because you asked the question. <laughs> I appreciate the responses I just got. That was very helpful. Uh, a, a point of curiosity is, you know, I've been involved with these tanks for way too many years. And I'm curious, when we look at the system plan, why were tanks scheduled after I'm dead? <laughs> I don't know. You know, well, when, it, we, when we pumped the liquids out of them, we knew that we had improved the safety of them dramatically, but we knew we did not get all the liquids out. And we knew that some of them were still available to leak. Uh, I, I think that the fact that this advice allows a determination of risk is very helpful because I have a hard time quantifying own sensibilities about 
how much added risk occurs if there's a leak in a very contaminated environment where the only remediation currently planned is groundwater treatment. Um, so I, I often question myself, why, why didn't we do them earlier? But we didn't, so. Anyway, I think the way you've handled the revision of the advice and the way you've responded to my questions is very helpful to me. Appreciate it. Sneak peek to April tanks meeting because we've been doing other things this week too. Um, we have an offer from Ecology to talk about the system plan in April at the tanks meeting. So uh, stay tuned. Yeah. Do you want to go through the advice points first or start at the top of the sheet of music? Hmm. Because today is about go, no go, I think that focusing on the advice points makes sense. Okay. Then is that all right with everybody? Good with that. I see a thumb up. All right. So there are. No, I can't remember how many advice points there are. <laughs> I think there are only three. There are only three now. <laughs> They have sub points, but they have yeah. sub points. Okay, well, let's go with number one. It's actually three lines long, right? Yep. Um, so we'll go through the advice points. This is where I want you to speak up because the question before you get to leave is: Should do you want to see this tomorrow for adoption? Um, I've got three folks on the phone. Is there anybody on the phone that wants to jump in the queue right now? I don't see anybody. Okay. Um, Laureen, what's on your mind? I see your hand. Um, <clears throat> referring to advice one, the board believes the agencies should remove the liquid waste. Um, I guess just for clarity for people that, you know, may not be familiar with agencies, can that be identified? Would that be enough, Laureen, to call them the tri-party agencies? Yes, that helps. I think it's identifies it a lot better. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other comments on one? Let's go to the technology bullet number two. Um, for new members, um, what often happens, we, we number them here in draft advice so that we can identify what we're talking about. It just makes it easier to find it. Um, in final advice, um, if it is adopted, we usually convert those just to, to bullets instead of numbers. Um, it's, it's an old habit. Steve Wigman. I hate, to, I hate to be a nag, but I have a question. Um, <laughs> I know there's been some discussion about the regulatory structure uh, for making decisions on single shell tanks. And I think even the GAO stepped into that one a while back. Um, you know, we debated a long time ago what regulatory structure the tanks, the old single shell tanks should have. And some of us argued for CERCLA and RECRA 1. Uh, in your discussions, did you deal at all with the regulatory structure of um, decision making for the tanks? Steve, if you're talking to me, the answer is no. If you're talking to David Bowen, I would guess the answer is probably also no, since he's <laughs> the regular authority. But <laughs> I know it's almost a rhetorical question at this point. Yeah. I personally think they're not appropriately regulated, but that would be a big bite to take out of the elephant. So I think this, this advice is probably not the place to broach that. Yeah, I think I don't know how much we talk about the how versus the what, and I would personally consider when we're talking about leak abatement, the regulatory framework under which you do it is is more the how 
and it's important, but it, it was not the focus here. Okay, thank you. Other comments, questions on number two about technology. So it's two paragraphs about technology. Let's go to this one. This one has a number of sub bullets, correct? Correct. This advice point um, with thanks to Dan Strong, Chris Sutton, many others who helped us to hone, simplify, um, and really understand that we're talking about many elements of a single plan that we are looking for. Um, and so hopefully this can be good guidance as the agencies figure out what this plan means. Um, and so it includes certain key elements. First one being outside input um, or other input, let's say, from a public tribe's EPA in the state of Washington. Um, the second one, as Chris Sutton was talking about, timely assessment and communication of single shell tanks. Not only that it occur, uh, but there are some, what I really appreciate, some guideposts uh, that specify the kind of information that might be of greatest interest to a person who has just recently discovered that there is a new tank uh, leaking. And so there, there's some specific discussion of kind of risk related topics. Uh, and there is a, a last point here that we debated whether it belongs on its own or under this umbrella, uh, specifically re requesting a risk assessment beyond B109. Uh, if you look at the monthly tank waste status reports, there is a tally of how much drainable liquid uh, is in all of the single shell tanks. And if you recall way back to, I think it was September when Brian Vance first talked to us about this advice, he described the leaking tank like a sponge that was holding water because of the salt and the pores in the salt. And that is mostly correct, but not entirely correct, because when that sponge gets overloaded, it will drip. And the uh, monthly report calculates of all of the liquid in the pores, how much will drip. And when you add that all up, when you tally it, it's 3.37 million gallons. Um, and you could go an extra step and know how much radioactivity is in that and compare it to our groundwater standards, et cetera. And so we're looking for that kind of uh, risk assessment to help better understand when it is worth uh, taking action for the sake of health and the environment. That's all I'll say. All right, Pam, you're in queue. Mine is simple. Um, I think that the last um, uh, bullet point that we have as G, allocate budget for managing single shell tanks, that should be budget advice number four. Thank you. So, so you're suggesting taking it out of this advice and putting it into the other one? I guess taking it out of making it part of the plan specifically and making it its own thing. Help us That's understand. What I, I gathered from what she said. Oh, okay. Pam, could you clarify where you would like this to move? I heard make it number four, is what she said. Okay. okay. All right, I'm going, I'm going with y'all's interpretation. Okay. And in the event you decide to look at it tomorrow, we can double check that with Pam. I, I know she's she's juggling some medical things with family. Right. Um so again, while we wait to see if people have feedback, the elements of the plan that we described would be um, input from others, timely assessment and communication of single shell tank leaks, timely response to single shell tank leaks, and this includes abatement or mitigation actions uh, with some public comment. We also said specifically that the board sees value 
in having a team that is equipped and trained to proactively remove SST liquids and respond to emerging leaks. Uh, item D, assessing the feasibility of current and potential future abatement technologies. Um, you know, I guess this is somewhat related to what is now advice point number two, but basically take the work you're doing to develop new tools and incorporate that in your plan as part of a cost feasibility implementability assessment to help you make decisions about where to focus your efforts. Uh, and then finally, having budget allocation specific to managing SST leaks going forward. Lorraine. Um, I have a question about the board um, having or seeing the value in having a team that is equipped and trained to remove um, the SST liquids. So is this done through DOE that's staffed or is this through a contracting agency? We were non-specific. What, what are you thinking about? Well, I was just curious um, whether, you know, is, is there currently a team that's in place for this process or is this something that needs um, further development? There is not currently a team that does this. Uh, and in our discussions among the issue management team, there was a, a vision that if you want to have the ability to respond rapidly when leaks occur, you know, B109, the amount of time it would take to actually gain access and get the waste out and move it somewhere is such that the, the odds of responding in time are small. Whereas the thought was, if you have a team that is on site um, who is already out there removing liquid from single shell tanks in a smart manner, uh, and this does assume that we are able to capitalize on some new options, uh, for pulling liquid out and then having something to do with it somewhere that it could go either whether that be storage after removal of the cesium via I like to say Tisker on a truck but some some sort of way um, or if that can enable off-site disposal that having a team out there who is equipped and trained and working and roving around the site makes it so that you are much more likely and able to respond if then an emerging situation occurs. So then this team that's um, put together, then would this be part of the notification process when a team is you know, developed and say they're out there and, and they're called to an emergency, would that be reported as is recommended? Would that be reported as is recommended? Right. because. Uh, up farther up on this document, it mentions that, you know, the timely um, communication of the leaks. And so that's my question with this team, you know, would this be part of that process where when they're called out for an emergency that that's part of the notification process? I think that they're separate but related. Sorry if I'm, I'm dominating the time here, but Department of Energy is already required to make notification when a tank leaks. Um, and they they perform that duty, uh, and there can be differing opinions about whether it's timely enough or how or what or what information you want, but that's already in existence. And so this would be, I, I personally think, a separate concept, um, having a team out there. Okay, you answered my question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Susan Luckman. Thank you. I was going to respond to that as well. Typically, when there is a team like this assembled, these folks have a regular job doing something else. And usually it's something related. They will get special training so that if there is a leak and there needs to be a response, I would suspect, be, this is because this is typical, that it would be the contractor responsible for that area of cleanup would have assembled a folks to be on that team, but they would have a regular job doing something else uh, and be able, this would be then prioritized through their own management structure. When there is a leak, okay, you guys, you know, A, B, C, D, you guys go 
over to here now because this is a priority one and whatever they were doing they would you know sort things out it would be a management responsibility for whichever contractor is responsible for that area of work and the, they would use the training facility to establish a locale for the lay down yards for whatever equipment that may or may not be needed and that that would all be in place if that's you know with the contractor so uh, i mean it's it's not something that hasn't been done before and they have response teams for other reasons and um this is not something that would be new uh, to anybody it would just be prioritized because of a leak and they would go address it that potentially this is all potentially thanks okay um so my next question then is you know they would then go through um they'd have a regular job and then they'd go through maybe the hammer facility for whatever certification to um, be specialized in this activity. And then is there a list of these teams that are put together that's identified? I would assume there would be. And we're making a lot of assumptions here based on what is the logical way to do this. And, okay. you know, and that's what would be the assumption. Is there currently a list of, um, you know, teams that are in place that do response? I think we'd have to ask DOE. Uh, you know, years okay. ago when I worked on Hanford site, there was, um, but things certainly may have changed. Okay, thank you. You bet. Rob. Yeah, I, I think one of the aspects of this was that when we were discussing and during our meetings and developing this is the fact that we don't even have a plan. We, we ask them when they have a leak, what are you going to do? Well, we don't know. They don't have a plan. And so a plan needs to be supported with a team of people that would manage that plan and figure out the best way to do so. They would have criteria, they do studies, but somehow get it together in a better sense than just telling us we got to live with it, okay? And and so I, I really think that th this is more than telling you how to do it. This is, your policy statement needs to support this kind of activity is what we're saying. I, I, is that not right? I mean, give me some nods, people, <laughs> because this is what we discussed a whole lot about we don't even have a plan. It's not written down. Nobody's written any of this stuff down and, and, and it's going to take months to implement it or a month or so to mobilize and all that stuff. So it's a long, it's got to have a plan to it. Oh, That's sure. our point. But anyway, I'm, thank you for listening. That makes sense. So how far down did we've got abatement technologies? We have scrolled through all of the advice points. And so we're at this point, we're just gathering feedback on those advice points. Uh, <clears throat> if we exhaust that, then maybe we can go back up into the background. Right. So the the anatomy of this draft of piece of draft advice, it actually has three parts. And I'm assuming you read it, but I'm going to say this anyway. There's the background part. There are the advice points that we just went through. And then when you look at the bottom of the screen right now, there's supporting background context. Um, in the evolution of this advice, the background went through multiple iterations of detail and revision. And um, in the, the spirit, the Susan Lechman spirit of less is more, the background sort of got split between the background and then this additional information that's context. So that's what you're seeing here. Um, so let's go back up to the background. We've got about half an hour. Um, <clears throat> fits on a single page. A single on page. A... <laughs> oh. Um. Can everyone read that all right? Do I need to zoom in any further? Uh, can you zoom in just a smidge more? My trifocal eyes are.
So let's just go paragraph by paragraph. Um, if you've got a, a suggestion or a question, um, raise your hand. Let me check in. Are the folks on the phone doing okay? We've got three of you. Do you have a question, an answer you want to share? Be a quiet phone person. All right, Steve Wigman. Yeah, I'm without reading all the words that are kind of blurry. I'm kind of curious. Do we recognize anywhere that the current remediation in place for this issue is groundwater treatment? And that is a very active program. Seems like we should acknowledge that that program is part of the venue of operation. Uh -huh. um, the second paragraph does talk about how um, the drainable liquid contains a significant inventory that would move through the Vado zone into the groundwater and then the river. Remediation of additional or new contaminants in the Vado zone or groundwater underlying the central plateau resulting from leakage would add to the long term management burden schedule and cost to clean up the central plateau. So yes, but from like a, a different side, if you will. We're saying that it will increase what you have to do. Well, my only point is we don't recognize that they are currently doing something. And that in fact, that might be all that's ever done for some of these soil contaminations. But it's not a failed program. It's not like they're just sitting there watching the stuff run down to the river. We've spent a lot of money and taken a lot of credit for some very successful groundwater treatment in the areas where this leakage will occur. I just think we should recognize that in the background. OK, we do have in the additional context. Uh, while it is expected that the contamination from B109 would reach the groundwater in 20 to 25 years and be captured by the pump and treat system, it would continue to add contamination to the groundwater long into the future. And the implication there is, how long do you want to be running that pump and treat system? Susan, do you have a way to help this? Yeah, I agree with Steve. I don't think it would hurt at all to say currently X number of gallons per year, and I know that number is out there or per month or however. Um, and I'm sure someone can give us that number of contaminated groundwater is being removed and remediated through the groundwater pump and, pump and treat system or something along those lines. I, I, I That makes sense. I, I think hopefully someone from DOE can help. I thought I heard Brian Vance this morning say it was about $2 billion, two billion gallons last year, and they're at about $1 billion this year. So it, it's looking $2 billion-ish this year as well. Yeah. Two hey, Ruth, gallons it's Carrie. Oh, Carrie, thank you. Hi. Yeah, so um, we have, we've been pretty consistent in delivering over $2 billion a year, and we're on track to do that again this year. Captured that. Cool. Susan, is your hand still up? Oh, no, but I, I just think there's remediation of additional new contaminants. And blah, 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 blah. There's a lot of words here. <laughs> I, I just think, and I, they're great words, but boy, there's a lot of words. And I, I'm just always a believer in shorter is better so that our message is clear. That's sometimes we get caught up in the details and it's hard to see the tree for the weeds. So just saying. And now I'll put my hand down <laughs> and stop talking. All right. Dana Miller, you've typed a question in the chat. Do you want to ask it yourself or would you like me to read it for you? Totally up to you. Ruth, actually, sorry, if I if I can jump in, I'm trying to respond to things as they are brought up. Susan, you talked about this sentence here being kind of a garble. Um, so I, I chopped it up a bit to make it shorter. Um, rather than 
saying all that, et cetera, simply new SST leakage would add to the long-term management burden, schedule, and cost to clean up the central plateau. Perfect. All right. Clearly. You betcha. Thanks, kiddo. Dana, you're next in queue. Okay, thank you. I was just wondering, uh, what are the long-term protection measures on these uh, leaking tanks? And then also, uh, wondering what the what is the lifespan of these abatement technologies? Would you have an idea of how long this abatement would, would last? Well, addressing the second question first, I think there are there are different ideas about what abatement could be. And what we are really asking for is for the agencies to develop new abatement technologies and also to evaluate some options that may be on on the shelf already. Uh, one such abatement technology could be to dry out the tanks further with moving air. Uh, and that's one thing that I heard David Bowen mention in his, his spoken list. Um, and if you dry out a tank, I mean, that to me, that works until you've retrieved that tank. And so I don't know that there is a duration component there. Another option that we've talked about uh, that was also discussed in the uh, SST liquid retrieval study from a couple of years ago is if you can actually just suction the liquid out of a tank using a low flow pump and an, like a, a larger salt well essentially and then if you had it somewhere for that liquid to go say something similar to what they're trying with the test bed initiative or some kind of on-site storage in a in a new form factor until it can be treated well, i would also argue that's permanent because you have removed it from the environment um, so it's not, uh, yeah, so that, that's the idea there as I understand it, but if others have different thoughts, please chime in. So we move on to the next paragraph. Excuse me, but, uh, yeah. I didn't hear an answer for the my first question. Are there long term protect protective measures against these leaking tanks? At the risk of speaking for DOE here, uh, the what we've heard described is there are existing uh, pump and treat wells, uh, at least in the case of this one tank that we learned was leaking last year, there's a pump and treat well very close to it. And so by the time it reaches the aquifer in 20 to 25 years, what was described to us was that um, the risk to the groundwater could be mitigated by pulling it up from that nearby pump and then treating it. Um, there are some questions about well, how long are you going to run that pump and how long would that risk persist? So yes, there are some uh, concepts in place, but I think that we still have questions and have asked that those be considered as part of the plan. Yeah, okay. I understand about the pump and treat, but that only, uh, that only targets one specific contaminant that doesn't go after all of the contaminants within the aquifer. Thank you. Steve Wigman. Yeah, I was just going to add in response to that question that all of the single shell tanks are planned to be, the waste is planned to be retrieved. And there is a current program in place to retrieve single shell tank waste and empty the tanks based on a scheduled agreement with ecology. So the ultimate destination of the waste in the single shell tanks currently is planned to be retrieved and treated. The timeline is stretched out a long ways. If that helps.
Jerry, do you need to jump in queue? Well, I would just explain my comment by saying um, I think there's a caveat. Um, you know, uh, if you even with removal of the pumpable liquid, you eventually get new pumpable liquid back in a tank. The only permanent abatement to answer Dana's question is removing all the waste from the tank. That is, you know, and Steve, don't die. If we're dependent on your living for emptying the tanks per your prior comment, you can't die. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, I'll so, be here to you. <laughs> long life. Um, uh, if there's correlation to leaks and you living, you need to live. Um, uh, so, but it's, I think very on a serious note, it's very important to understand because with B109, we saw um, and we've presented to the board how the liquid level in the tank was increasing and increasing at a steady rate every year until the leak, um, the bottom fell out, so to speak, in terms of the mass of leak in 2018 to 2019. Um, and if you try to dry the waste out, we've seen that that has very limited success. And again, it re-entrains liquid and you'd have to dry it again. So I've got more folks in queue. I'm going to go to John Price. Go to at John Ecology. Price. Yeah, thanks. I was going to try and answer Dana's question. So you may have seen my chat earlier when you're talking about priorities. Um, DOE Richland is going to come out with a milestone to develop uh, deep vadosone remediation technologies. Um, and so I'm thinking in the next four years, they'll complete some treatability tests and they might have some decisions on deploy deploying those technologies a couple years after that. So you're probably looking at at least 2030 before there would be some deep vadosone technologies available, I would be hopeful those would be applied to the soils around tank farms as well. But you know that kind of gives you the time frame. So I hope that answers your question, Dana. So I have Laureen and Steve Anderson in queue. Laureen. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm going back to the main points that were covered of the revised advice, um, specifically number seven, where it says include ecology and others in the leak assessment process. Can you identify who the others are? That is a good question. Uh, boy, are, are you referring to the advice revision from back in December? I can't remember where that point it's, um, Yeah, it's numbered in the main points of the revised advice, and I believe that this was shared maybe this morning. Where number one, value, assess, abate, and respond to SST leaks to the extent feasible. So I don't, I don't know if you have that available, but it was covered um, earlier today and I actually used my phone and took a snapshot of it. Oh, was it was it in the cleanup priorities advice? It could have been, yes. Okay, I, let me look at that. Let me look that up real quick. Can, can I answer part of that question? Why don't you uh, answer uh, that while I'm madly trying okay. to find it? I, I think part of the question really gets to the point is, is that we're feeling that that DOE needs to involve um, other um, others would be uh, maybe there's uh, special consultants, maybe there's universities, maybe there's uh, uh, oil and chemical industry knows how to do something. Others meaning that there's other technologies that what we have to develop on our own, um, and and we we need to 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 look into that and use that. Um, and so uh, so I think the others was is we kind of want to leave it kind of open-handed is that we want for our site the best answer is possible and if it means you got to go talk to you know mining and metals uh, you know and find something out then let's do it um let's involve 
other people in some of these um, discussions. That's it. Thanks. So appropriate experts. And when this first came through, this, this concept of involving ecology and others, it was specific to that window of time where you're saying, do we have a leaking tank? Maybe we have a leaking tank. We're not sure if we have a leaking tank. Let's go look for some evidence to say whether yes or no, we do. And with B109, that process took a while. Um, and the, the front end of that process was fairly lengthy and involved mostly contractor staff. Um, and I believe DOE came in at one point and Ecology came in at one point later in the process. And we were merely saying, I, I don't think it made it into the final advice that having your regulator involved in that is it is it not leaking conversation sooner might offer you some valuable perspective. Lorene, there was a, a line. I'm not finding it in the cleanup priorities advice from from earlier today. There was a line in an earlier version of this advice. Yes. that that use that language um, and it looks I'm not I'm not finding it in this current version so I'm kind of wondering if maybe you ended up with an earlier version the version I opened is the one that was in the email for this meeting so hopefully let me check my own files Okay, I'm looking at my snapshot and it was shared at 2.50 p.m. <laughs> so, um, hey. yeah. Hmm. I don't think we sent anything out at 2.50. Five, I guess on the recording it, it's identified as 532.11, so that's where it would be in the recording. But Bruce, anyway. she's not saying you sent it out. It was put up on the screen and yeah. she took a picture of it with her phone. Yeah. Oh, thank you. I'm I'm yeah. sorry for being confused. Oh, so it, it was in my PowerPoint presentation. It, That's I believe so. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> so my PowerPoint presentation was showing kind of the Cliff Notes version of the different versions of our advice. And so, yes, in the version, here, I can put it up on the screen here. Um, so this is the, oops, uh, right there, number seven. I see what you're talking about. This was the advice that we brought before the board in December. Uh, and that was the one that people commented upon. It was sent back to committee for work. Um, I, I honestly can't remember why that particular point didn't make it all the way into the one that you see today. Um, if you'd like to make a pitch, go, go for it. Well, my the reason why I asked the question is because, you know, I, I rely heavily on my cultural technical staff for Yakima Nation ERWM to, you know, bring to my attention, you know, issues uh, out on the site and, you know, with so many players, you know, that are out there and and you know i've only been out to hanford myself you know just a handful of times so you know that my staff identifies areas that may have you know like a um you know be culturally affected or you know so that that's my my question is you know when you identified others you know that that you're going to include others i'm hoping that that involves the yakima nation as well so that we can make a determination on you know specific concerns to you know whatever site is affected so Jeff, under 3A, how that that includes a broader set of folks, right? Uh, yes, but <laughs> it, it does. But that one is related more to this plan that we are talking about. Um, this point that we're discussing right now was a prior point that was specifically focused on that process of determining whether a leak exists. And I can show it to you from an earlier draft just because we're talking. 
um, involvement of ecology and other experts in leak assessment. Um, and the, you know, the real take home point, the lead regulatory agency should be involved for any process that's looking at data to determine whether a tank has lost containment um, was a point that was in that prior advice. But it didn't make it into this draft. Yeah, and honestly, I, I can't remember the story there. If anyone else remembers, please chime in. Um, I'm not opposed to it. Chris, are you on you? Are you on this point or a different point? This point. Okay. The reason it got taken out is because we felt that that was a responsibility of of ecology anyway to be on point for all the things that we've been discussing and to take the lead uh, with DOE in addressing them. So we didn't feel it was necessary to put in something which we felt was their responsibility anyway. Fog is clearing. Lorene, does that help dissipate the confusion? Yes, thank you. So we'll right. go to the ecology then. Right. Steve Anderson, thank you for waiting. You're next. For waiting. You're next. Okay, thanks, uh, Ruth. I guess I'm not really. Um, Talking to that point, and it's more of a general. I, I agree with exactly what we're doing here, and I'm glad that it aligns with ecology. Um, but I did have a couple of questions that came up that I thought might help clarify. Um, Jeff, when you referenced the 3.3 million gallons that is available liquid right now, uh, does DOE agree with that number? Uh, I can tell uh, you. I can tell you that that. Sorry, there's a bit of an echo. This is another slide that I didn't show today, but that was in my deck. There is a monthly report that is published um, called the Waste Tank Summary Report. Uh, and it has a column called Drainable Interstitial Liquid. And as I was doing research into the B109 leak, came to understand that Drainable interstitial liquid is the name for when you've done the math to find out how much would drip out of the sponge, if you will. Um, it is the stuff that would actually come out of the tank if the tank had a leak, you know. And in our Oregon Hanford cleanup board meeting a couple of months ago, I talked about this 3.37 million gallon figure. And um, originally, uh, Tom Fletcher said, well, now, be careful because that might not be the stuff that would drip. And Delmar Noyes came in and said, well, no, actually he's right. Um, so I'll, that's what I've got is Delmar agreed with me. <laughs> so. Okay, I guess, I because I know they, they've removed a tremendous volume of water from the single shells, I mean, or mm -hmm. the liquid. And at some point they went, mm, we're gonna stop and we're gonna move our money and efforts other directions. So, I mean, if it was, you know, you don't take a pool full of water and go halfway and say, yeah, now we're just going to go do something else. I wouldn't think. Um, but I am uh, uh, kind of curious as to why they believe and the whole context of what we put together here is uh, we think that they should be draining leaking tanks as opposed to other methods, which is the pump and treat. They say, you know, it's it's not cost effective. It's more effective for us to just use what we're already doing. Um, that's why we're not reprioritizing and emptying these tanks. At least that was the sense of what I got from the conversations that we've had earlier about this topic. And, and we don't believe that that's really paying enough attention to the real problem, the real issue, which is leaking tanks. Um, I guess that was really, that was, that was really my only other point. Oh, I guess the other one was, uh, um, you said that uh, ecology had been a part of the the new dates for when they're going to have everything retrieved. You know, I, what we had up here was 2018. Yeah, everything's going to be dry in the single shell tanks. And now it's 2061. And ecology like said, oh, yeah, that's a good number. We'll go with that one now instead. I mean, is that really what, what occurred in that conversation and negotiation? 
Well, before John Price raises his John hand Price to correct his hand to correct that one, I'll say that. Uh, okay, no worries. The uh, the current milestone, I believe, is in the 2040s to complete all the single shell tank retrievals. However, um, ever since System Plan 8 came out back in 2018, when people actually run the model of how fast we can get all this done with the funding we've got, that's where the 2060s numbers have come from. And I think part of the holistic negotiations is about how do we come to terms with that? Again, at the risk of speaking for others, sorry. All right, so I'm gonna be the wet rag and give you a 10 minute warning or a nine minute warning. Um, the go, no go question is coming in like eight minutes. So let's see how far we can get through the background before I ask you that question. How far did we get through the background, Jeff? Well, Steve is in queue. We have, um, I believe we just had two paragraphs left uh, in the background. I don't know to what extent we want to dive into the supplemental background, the back background. The, 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 the behind the background. So Steve Wigman. Uh, thank you. I, I was just going to comment based on some of my historical memory that when we were doing the salt well pumping of single shell tanks, we pumped until we got to a de minimis level to the point where we didn't believe we could pump successfully any more free water from the tanks. And at that time, we expected that there was in fact going to remain some potentially leakable waste that would would drain, but you couldn't pump it. You couldn't get enough head on it to actually suck it out. Um, so just a point of, there wasn't, and as I recall, there wasn't a, an arbitrary decision, to, oh, what's going to stop pumping that tank? We, we tried to pursue the limits of technology at the time. And that's based on a recollection that's pretty old. Can I jump in here a sec? This is yeah. Shelley. You know, another piece of, of limits of technology is that when uh, a first technology that's been implemented in a tank to pump it um, reaches, you know, it's the inability of, of being a further service, then there's an evaluation. And if there's a second technology, then that's uh, utilized. And, and, uh, and also a third can be implemented if there, you know, there was to be one. So... Um, I feel, I guess I feel like uh, they've been pretty darn thorough in uh, in doing what they can at this point. But there are, you know, there are, there's more than one technology that is looked at um, as a template for, you know, the ability to, to uh, remove more liquids. Thanks. So let's take a look at the last two paragraphs in oh. the... Um, in the background, this is the background before the advice points to see if there are any questions, concerns, suggested revisions. Anyone? It includes you all on the phone. I know you're being quiet out there, but we want to include you if you have a concern. Right. I'm going to ask the go no go question. Does anybody object to this coming before you tomorrow for adoption? You have have suggestions and and wordsmithing. We do have some time tomorrow for that. I'm not asking you to approve it lock stock and barrel today. I'm asking if you want to see it tomorrow. Uh, one last comment. Yeah. Uh, I'm always curious. <clears throat> I, don't always, I don't always expect an answer, but I'm always curious how DOE expects to respond to our advice, especially when it wasn't solicited. So if, if DOE has anything to say about how they would respond to this advice, I would appreciate hearing it. 
Hey, Steve, this is Carrie. Um, so as you know, I'm just kind of coming back in from this other assignment. So um, I'll take a look at it. Um, I did hear what I, well, I did hear David Bowen's comment earlier. Um, and, you know, while it may not be solicited advice, um, it's still advice that you guys have worked on and reflects the communities you represent. So um, we'll, we'll look at it and get back to you. Thank you, that's very helpful. All right, so let me give you a preview of the morning and you can tell me if it's gonna work or if we need to do something different. Um, I had queued up the advice for you all to work through in the morning in the order you saw it today. Membership first, cleanup priority second, tanks third. My observation today was there was more conversation about the membership advice um, and potential revisions than I heard on the cleanup priorities or the tank leak advice. Do you want to go with the order membership cleanup priorities tanks or do you want to reorder that tomorrow um, as you work through gaining consensus on one or more of those pieces of advice? Anyone? I think we'll get through them all. Yeah, yeah the t today's order was okay with me. Okay. One, one comment I would make though is we still have the problem of only a few voices. And regardless of what happens with term limits and all the other uh, shenanigans, it would sure be good to find a way to determine if we need a broader voice or does this small group actually speak for the full half? And I don't know the best way to find that out. We could do a survey, we can keep encouraging people. I notice there are a few people starting to speak up, but the fundamental energy comes from a few people. And I appreciate the energy that you put into that, but at the same time, we have a lot of seats that are pretty quiet. And I don't know how best to deal with that. I right. hope that we could get a, a discussion with ourselves and our tri-party agencies that would focus on our future in a way that either accepts the way it's now happening or modifies our style somewhat so that we can hear everybody. That's so that's a pitch. <laughs> right. And, and, and you you all have heard that I, I literally, in addition to what we're doing, monitor the email and my text. So if for some reason speaking up in chat isn't your thing yet, um, there are other ways to reach Josh and myself if you want to say, I have a question, I'm concerned, I'm worried, whatever. Um, it's, it's easier if you do it in chat. Um, but we, but I do monitor that other, those other forms during the meeting. I have Jan and Ginger in queue. Jan? So the question seems to be, you know, how do we order it tomorrow so we can make best use of our time? And certainly um, the EIC uh, advice engenders a lot of conversation. You know, you could you know, curtail that by putting it at the end of the day so that nobody has any time. <laughs> but I think that that um, honestly, it it is more current in its interest, which is why it has, you know, engendered so much conversation. So I, you know, I am in favor of tackling that first. And secondly, if we're talking about having um, more conversation among the, the board members. All I can say is that some people have been quiet for a long time because they were kind of trying to figure out um, where they stand and what their, uh, what their advocacy is. But I think that um, as we have welcomed more and more comments from people, we're getting more comments. That's a good thing. But in all, 
it's going to be so much better when we can meet in person, talk in person, get acquainted in person, and then people will feel more confident about talking about uh, their observations. So um, number one, EIC. Number two, I hope we can get back to in-person meetings soon. We are actively talking about hybrid meetings for Committee of the Whole and the Leadership Workshop in May. Ginger. Hello, everyone. I am Ginger Wehrman. For those of you who don't me know me and are on the thing, um, I'm at Ecology. I just, I don't know. <laughs> I still personally find teams really cumbersome and I still think it would be good to move to Zoom if that would be allowed at some point because it's just more flexible and easier to use. Um, and also, you know, Bruce brought it up, I've brought it up, Liz has brought it up. There are other tools in the toolbox for online meetings that um, like shared whiteboards and things like that, that people can use that maybe people can just you know, jot a thought on a whiteboard and it really doesn't matter what order they're in, but then they're captured and Ruth doesn't have to necessarily be trying to juggle three balls at once to figure out who's in the queue. Like if you just want your your point made and it's on a joint whiteboard, um, that would be great. The other thing is I really appreciate everybody's time and energy and dedication to serving on this board. I do have a tip though. If you could go out and get yourself another monitor for 50 bucks probably <laughs> and plug it into your computer so you have one screen for documents and one screen for faces or chat or whatever, it will make your, your meeting process imminently better. Um, than just trying to figure it all out on one little screen, especially if you have a, a laptop. So um, there's my pitch for expanding our use of technology, which might seem scary, but could actually work better. I, I currently have three computers running. Um, I've got Carrie, Bob, and Jerry. We're, we're a little bit into overtime, um, but let's do it. Carrie? Hey, thanks. Um, Ginger, for your comments, the only caveat I would add is that um, if DOE is participating, we just have to be careful what we can access. Um, we have a lot of firewall restrictions and we can't always use everything that's out there. But, um, you know, if we need to, unless there's some requirement that Gary wants to correct me on, um, we can, I think, have that conversation. Now, Carrie, I'm not going to uh, correct you on that. You're exactly right. Uh, IT is is uh, we we can crack that nut. We we can uh, alter our platforms. We're not married to uh, Teams, and we are flexible. It's just what we can do with uh, with security and uh, make things accessible to uh, members and the public. Okay, I've got Bob, Gary, and Susan Lechman. Bob. Um, getting back to tomorrow morning, uh, I guess I'd like to challenge everybody to uh, read through the background section of the membership advice. Uh, we never have got through that. And as a homework assignment, you need to read it so we can hopefully get through that part efficiently tomorrow. Um, the caveat is that the group of folks who agreed to do some wordsmithing on that advice are going to just stay on the line and we will take a short break and then come back and do some of wordsmithing after we wrap this up. Um, Jerry, you had a, a comment in the yeah. chat and I know not everybody can see that, so yeah. that's why I put you in queue. Right, which is something that is, I was going to say, is one of the reasons that you call on people, thank you, is uh, you know, those on the phone can't read the chat. Um, and um, across Washington state, I don't know if Oregon is doing this, but um, we are encouraging all local governments uh, and school boards, et cetera, to basically use a hybrid system, have meetings in person and to broadcast using Zoom, Teams or whatever at the same time 
and allow for both presentations and public comment via the online platform. It is not rocket science, it's quite easy to do. And I think as the board moves forward, um, it would greatly increase the ability of the public to observe and participate in the board to have that available. Um, instead of going back to just in person, you can have the best of both worlds. Um, secondly, I guess um, I want to raise the flag over where, you know, there are no objections to the membership advice tomorrow. At this point in time, we're going to be working on that. Um, but uh, I a large number of our organizations have our membership packets due on Friday. And um, there's been no indication whatsoever that the Energy Department is going to consider giving us any extension to have any dialogue about this. And so um, we're having to prepare a packet that is based on the application of undefined diversity rules and term limits here. Um, and I know that Heart of America Northwest is not the only organization doing this. Uh, and I suspect it might be more difficult for some other organizations. Um, so I'd like to know what energy is doing in terms of or and is there any conversation with the ecology EPA and energy about um, deferring the applications that are due on Friday because they're due. And the word to date was, uh, we'll remove you from the board if you don't meet our criteria on Friday. Yeah, hi, this is Gary. I'll, I'll uh, take a shot at answering that. Uh, the term limits is what uh, the administration is putting forward, and that is clearly spelled out in the uh, uh, membership packet that everybody has received. Uh, as far as diversity is concerned, we're not looking at numbers. Per se, we're looking to increase recruitment uh, primarily for female and Hispanic members. However, any qualified member who applies will be considered. Uh, March 25th is the deadline uh, so that we can get the packet in. Uh, and at that date, uh, we're still looking at probably an October or November approval date. If we push the packet uh, submission out further, we might not get it approved this calendar year. So we are doing our recruitment. We are doing uh, packet acceptance through this Friday. And like I said, term limits uh, are, are in the packet. Uh, so if a person has served more than six years, they're not eligible for uh, for reappointment. However, if a group shows that they've done considerable outreach and are unable to come up with other candidates, then we will consider uh, exceptions to term limits. But uh, to caveat with that, there, there must be an example of, of uh, uh, outreach, such as uh, meeting minutes or copies of emails that you've sent out to other folks, maybe a, a newsletter clipping or something that shows that, that some outreach was done. I hope that answers your question, Jerry. Well, unfortunately, that's the very first time I've heard anything described about outreach. Um, and while Heart of America Northwest is set with our packet and will be welcoming someone new, um, uh, which I'm very excited about. I this it's like a, an example. It's 48 hours before deadline, and you're saying, "Oh well, now we've got something different that's not in writing in your packet." And I would urge you to. Give groups time and put that out in writing and explain what it is you mean by that. Because, uh, for example, um, 
there's doing outreach to have someone join the board and then there's doing outreach for someone to join the board who can spend three days a week uh you know three days in a week couple this eight times a month or more to participate in a board and there's a big difference and there's a need to define what you mean by outreach yeah jerry i i hear what you're saying and at the bottom of the letters that went out uh, i put my phone number on there so that people could contact me with questions <laughs> and i've been available to answer questions and my phone has been very very quiet uh there, there's been only a couple of folks who have called with questions i'm here to assist at any time uh both email and phone and we want to do what we can to help make this uh, process successful it's not perfect we are adjusting to administration guidelines and we're trying to make this happen to uh, to help the HAB succeed and to help the administration succeed. And we're in the middle trying to make it work for both. I've got Harry, Stan, Susan, Rob in queue. Um, Carrie um, and Lorraine. Carrie, I'm putting you up. Rob has a question that maybe you can answer um, in addition to whatever you were thinking of saying um, that he typed in queue. Carrie? So, so I was just gonna, sorry, I couldn't get off mute, um, add to Gary's, Gary's, um, remark, which, um, was that we have expressed, at least I have, um, on at least two other, during at least two other meetings that, um, if recruitment was done and an organization was unable to find a new candidate, they could put in the request for a term limit exemption. Term limit exemptions are not guaranteed, um, but you know we have had that um, out there, and that was it. Um, Rob's question, um, you or Stan can answer. If one seat is missing, presumably missing an applicant, will the rest of the packet be held up from you sending the entire packet to headquarters for review? So what? Uh, go, go ahead, Gary. Gary. No, you go ahead. You're working that. Thanks. OK, yeah, for, for Rob, uh, we're trying to get the packet as complete as possible. And uh, if there's an, an alternate uh, for a seat that is on a current appointment, what we may wind up doing with the uh, uh, concurrence of the organization is do an administrative change where the alternate becomes the primary. Uh, and and uh, we're we're going to do what we can to both meet our deadline and also be sensitive to the needs of of stakeholders. But we've got to get this uh, packet through, and uh, and get that going so we can get approvals. Dan, I saw your hand as well. Dan Branch. Are you with us, Stan? Okay, there you are. Get you off a of mute. He must have jumped the river. Okay, well, let's go to Susan. Uh, I, well, I'll, I'll okay. try a different. I'll, I'll try a different mute. Uh, I'm trying to trying to work two different. Uh, items here either on the phone or on the computer i get the feedback from the computer so i'll just use the computer phone but essentially uh, as carrie indicated um you know we've had these discussions on a number of occasions about term limits in addition to term limits have been around for some time you know this is just the first uh time that these the new the this administration has decided to enforce these term limits so it's nothing new um, and uh, the other reason is that, you know, these uh, time limits are staggered so that not everyone's uh, time term expires at the same time. So that keeps that uh, experience and, and uh, continuity going amongst the, uh, the members on the board. 
that's pretty much it. Um, uh, back to you, Ruth. Susan and Lorene, thank you for waiting. Susan. Thank you. No amount of technology replaces in-person meetings. I really am glad to see that there is a suggestion to do a hybrid meeting. But in order for this board and especially the new members to get a sense of what this board has been about and, and, I, and I applaud that there are, are new members. That makes a lot of sense. Um, it is unfortunate that just a lot of folks who still have a lot of passion for cleanup and doing the right thing and working collaboratively with the agencies will unceremoniously be dumped. And I'm sorry to see that, but um, I, I absolutely am an advocate for in-person meetings. It's time we get back to that. It's way too easy to check a box when you don't have to look somebody in the eye. So, and I really would like to have an opportunity to meet some of the new members and encourage them as I always did when I was chair, encourage people to speak up, ask questions. That's what they should be doing. We should be asking questions. Thank you. All right. Hi, Susan. Great. This is Gary. I just wanted to respond that we are actively working on setting up a hybrid meeting, and we're looking at uh, uh, how we can do that. I, I don't want to get into it, but it's considerably harder for hybrid than it is for in person. But we're working through the issues. But uh, I want to let you know you're not going to be allowed in the door without cookies. Just saying. Just saying. Okay, Lorreen, thank you for waiting. Yes, thank you. Um, I just wanted to follow up on the, you know, concerns surrounding, you know, the the whole application process. And um, Gary indicated that his information is in the letter and on the application form. So I know when I filled out my application and submitted it, I was being asked um, to submit it to somebody else who was also on the email address. So my apologies, I didn't even I didn't even send it to um, Gary, but I do see on the letter that it you know indicates that. But you know that to me it's it's still the the point that you know you have you've told people certain people that they're going to be kicked out if they even apply, and that's almost you know like a bully tactic in in my eyes. And so you know what I shared with Mr. Vance this morning is you know, and I'm going to reiterate that I think it's being done backwards. I think you should allow you know continued participation by you know those that are you know held have been held in high regard and and not disrespect you know the work that they've done and contributed to the board to date and you know and i appreciate hearing the history you know coming from you know certain individuals i've only been a participant for two years and you know like i said earlier today due to covid i haven't been able to meet people in person or you know and that makes a huge difference when you're new to a group and you know, and you're trying to establish, you know, communication and, you know, so it is a huge concern. And, you know, I'm, I'm a, I, I back the idea of, you know, if you're, if you're allowing exceptions for some, then it needs to be applied across the board and fair to everybody, not just the few who, you know, DOE deems is, you know, satisfactory in their eyes. And, you know, to be told this morning that, you know, they, it was an administrative initiative that was discussed with ecology and EPA. That's not the information that we received, you know, when we met with these agencies and then to be told, we'll leave it at that. You know, I was a little insulted by Mr. Vance that, you know, he, he was irritated by my comment. And as a new member, you know, that doesn't make, um, you know, going forward feel any better. So I just wanted to, you know, say that because I know I've been told, you know, if you, don't speak up and say something about it now, then don't complain about it later. So I'm speaking up because I am a member of the board and, you know, and I feel like my voice is just as important as someone else's and that, you know, those that have been allowed an exemption, you know, 15 out of 31 seats, um, that's over half. Why aren't they being held to the same standard? It's not fair. Thank you. Gary? Thanks, Ruth. Um, it, so uh, that was Lorraine, correct? Yes, Lorraine from Yakima. Yeah, thank you, Lorraine. So I, I do hear what you're saying, and I want to clarify a few things. Any of the groups can put in a request for a term limit exemption. We've never said 
somebody would be booted off of the board. That's not, um, that's not what we've said. Okay, we have said that public interest, public at large, universities, those um, seats that are not assigned to a specific organization, if they want to request a term limit exemption, they need to submit the documentation showing that they did try to recruit um, a, a new representative, okay? And, you know, um, in regards to Brian saying we would just leave it at that, I don't think his intent, I know his intent was not to insult. It was because he's aware that we've had many conversations on this with the board, with committees, and it, that was his only intent there. Thank you. All right. Um, that was Carrie Meyer. She's the communications director um, on the Hanford site. All right, everybody take a deep breath. You're going to see all three pieces of advice in the morning. You're going to get emails tonight. Actually, I think you're going to get one email. I think we only want to do this once. You're going to get one email tonight <clears throat> with all three pieces of advice as they have been revised and improved. Um, I'm not going to forget you, Tom. Um, <laughs> we're going to take a short break after we wrap this up and the folks who are working on the membership advice are going to reconvene and do some wordsmithing. Um, but we are going to take a, a lap around the living room to get a little more coffee. That's the plan. Tom Galeotto, you've got the last word before oh, I give wow. it to Steve. I'm, ah, I'm, I gotta give it to Steve. Okay. I'm honored. Oh, I'm not honored. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to mention that at least one request for exemption of a six year term has been submitted to my knowledge. It was a unique situation. I haven't heard a thing about the status of that or how it's being handled or not handled. Uh, it would be helpful to to know what is to be done with that request. From DOE. Thank you. Sure, Tom, I'll, I'll respond to that. We're working on a response and uh, We'll, we'll give a response to the uh, appropriate person first, and then we'll announce that at, at the appropriate time. That's still working through staff. Okay, thank you, Gary. Right. Steve Wigman, you really do get the last word. Oh, goody, goody, goody. <laughs> so, uh, tomorrow afternoon late is a very important opportunity to hear about how DOE currently is utilizing risk as a basis for decision making. And my concern is, for example, right now I see that we've only got 15 people still signed in. We lose people toward the end of days, especially on the second day. So. I would ask that if we don't have very many attendees toward the end of tomorrow when we talk about risk, that we keep that in the light and that we continue conversations around risk and what we think risk is and how it's used in our thinking as board members, as interested parties, and as the agencies that have to make the decisions that protect us all. So. If you have an opportunity, put a plug in to your friends to please attend that discussion at 2.30 tomorrow. And thanks for today. This was a challenging day and everybody conducted themselves in a very professional manner and I appreciate that. All right, we kick off at nine in the morning. Um, and like I said, I, I have the, the draft tanks advice. Tom Galeotto is gonna get me the the cleanup priorities advice and those changes, and we'll work on the membership advice. Look for a single email with those pieces of advice and please read them before we talk. That will make the um, discussions and wordsmithing a little easier. Thank you for sticking with it and uh, the extra 25 minutes. We really appreciate it. So, Ruth, when are we meeting for wordsmithing the membership advice? Can can we like give ourselves five minutes to go get some more coffee? 
<laughs> like, so just stay on the line, and I I promise I'll be back in five minutes. Okay. So, so yeah, just stay on the line if you want to be part of the wordsmithing party. Um, and we are not recording the wordsmithing part party. Okay, we're, we're not going to record that. So. Can I ask Gary a question? Yeah. Thank you, yes, sir. Uh, I've been working with Wendy Coverell at the Journal of Business on the progress edition. They're including a discussion of the HAB, and she sent me a final draft, and I sent that on to you and Carrie. I'm just wondering if you received it. I received it, and I will take a second look at it after the meeting, and I will push that on to, uh, to Wendy because I know that they're on deadline there. Perfect. Thank you very so much. Gary, um, yes, sir. So, yeah, Gary and Steve, I've got it as well. So I was going to go look at it here in just a few minutes and we'll send any comments to Gary so he can get them and you so that you guys can get them taken care of. Thank Thanks. you. I think you did a good job of editing it, but it also is a note for folks who want to participate in the board to contact Gary. And I wanted to make sure that that's OK with you folks. Absolutely. Thank you all. Have a great day, everybody.